Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to the November 18th uh, electronic uh, meeting of the Waterloo Regional Police Service Board. Due to a technical difficulty, but in order to continue to live stream, as we have told the community, this live stream will happen through the Region of Waterloo Council channel and can be seen on the website of Waterloo Region, and it will subsequently be downloaded and will be available on the Waterloo Regional Police Service website. We acknowledge the land on which we gather today is a traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people. We acknowledge the enduring presence of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land today, their achievements and their contributions to our community. We offer this acknowledgement in an act of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples of Canada. I'd like to again welcome everybody and ask the board if there are any declarations of pecuniary interest. Seeing none, the next item is uh, the consent agenda items. Does anyone have any items from the consent agenda they would like moved to the regular part of the agenda? And if yes, where you would like to see them placed on the agenda? I'm seeing nobody indicating. So the consent agenda is moved by Rosita C and seconded by Ian McLean. All those in favor could please indicate with your hands. I can see everybody. That is carried. Thank you. Is there any business arising from the minutes? The next agenda item is a delegation. Mr. Sam Naby is joining us today to provide a delegation on behalf of Relocate WR. Sam, did I butcher your last name? Thank you, Chair Edmund. Yeah, it's uh, Sam Naby. Naby, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, as a reminder, uh, delegations are given 10 minutes to address the board. Welcome, Mr. Naby. You have 10 minutes and you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Redmond and members of the board. Um, my delegation is primarily with respect to report 2021-92 that will be discussed later on, uh, proposed 2021 budget. I'm speaking today on behalf of over 320 people who have signed on in support of Reallocate WR. We are a group of concerned residents that came together to support local black community leaders calls to defund the police and reinvest in services for underfunded communities. Many of us participated in the Solidarity March for Black Lives in June, the largest mass demonstration our region has ever seen. And we joined the calls for justice against police violence happening across the world, including in Canada and here in Waterloo Region. This summer, the record published an editorial stating, whatever well-intentioned efforts Waterloo Regional Police have made to root out anti-Black racism in their ranks, the problem persists. The editorial went on to say, more sensitivity training or mandating body cameras simply won't cut it. This summer's use of force report shows that Black people in Waterloo Region are four times more likely than white people to be stopped or surveilled by police and police use of force against Black people remains disproportionately high. We don't expect the police to do everything or to be perfect, but we do expect the officers serving our region to earn the trust of the communities they claim to protect, to behave beyond reproach, and to take ownership of past failings. Instead, when the Somali Canadian Association of Waterloo Region organized a town hall in the wake of Abdi Salam Omar's violent arrest at the hands of Waterloo Region Police, Chief Larkin and other police representatives responded to community concerns with defensiveness, deflecting questions, and avoiding accountability. We don't expect our elected officials to be perfect either. But when the region's largest ever mass protest demands fundamental changes to policing, we expect some follow-up. We expect the members of this board, especially those who also sit on regional council, to have had proactive conversations with Chief Larkin about reallocating funding to prioritize community safety. 
I was saddened to hear Chief Larkin say in an interview with CBC last month, I have not seen a plan and nobody's called me with a plan. In a recent interview, former regional chair Ken Sealing has spoken about how regional council and the police services board helped to guide priorities and provide valuable input to the police administration as they develop the budget each year. He said that after hearing these priorities, the police chief and the board will take it back. And generally speaking, they've been able to do, uh, generally speaking, they've been able to do those sort of things. Where is the leadership from this board and from regional council to guide the budget process? Why did police administration feel that it was appropriate to ask for an $8 million increase in the midst of a municipal budget crunch? The updated budget report being considered today knocks that 5.04% increase down to 4.8% increase through reductions in expenses. This 4.8% increase is still higher than inflation in any of the forecasted scenarios. This isn't what regional council asked for. In some areas, there are ways to reduce costs without affecting level of service. As the region invests in automated traffic enforcement, tickets from red light cameras and speed cameras are increasing while traffic charges filed by police have dropped from 40,000 in 2017 to 33,000 in 2019. The current budget crunch is a great time to accelerate this trend and save policing costs when it comes to traffic enforcement. I was disappointed to read the section of this report dedicated to cost recovery, which entails moving more money from municipal budgets to the police budget under a different line item. This may make the police budget look more responsible by keeping the net levy lower, but this approach just shifts costs around. And at the end of the day, those recovered costs come from the same municipal budgets that fund all the other essential services in our region. This is no way to balance a budget. It just disguises a police budget increase, leaving less room for everything else. When advocates bring up the idea of defunding to reallocate, Chief Larkin has said that reducing $29.3 million from WRPS is the equivalent of 216 officers. Well, there is $8.7 million that the police service didn't use in 2020 and plans to carry forward to help fund the 2021 capital budget. The first draft of the 2021 budget planned for 9.6 million in reserves sitting in a bank account, not being spent. A lot of that reserve fund money comes from contributions from the operating budget. I understand the need for long-term planning, but I can't think of many social services with millions of dollars in operational surplus and reserves kicking around. Everyone here at this meeting knows that the root causes of crime and violence go far beyond the scope of policing itself. We know that vital services like the Sexual Assault Support Center have to rely on fundraising campaigns to meet payroll the One Roof Youth Shelter has just launched a GoFundMe campaign to raise $850,000 for the first phase of a new supportive housing project for vulnerable youth. The region is considering defunding five childcare centers to reduce the budget deficit. The IMPACT program, which pairs mental health responders to 911 calls, is severely underfunded and understaffed. IMPACT is only able to respond to half the calls where they're needed. While the police service is active in the community and helps raise awareness for several great causes, it's time to rebalance this financial equation and properly fund upstream services. And this brings me to the plan put forward by Reallocate WR. I won't go through all the details, but we demand that the region and this police services board act on the community's call for reallocation and reinvestment into community, social and health services. And this is a transition that is urgently needed. We want to see expanded community health centers, greater transit access, a community safety model for mental health and harm reduction, supportive housing, and many other programs. Reinvestment in defunded and underfunded communities, social and healthcare services led by and for Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities will be a vital contributor to our community's ability to center our voices and co-create our futures. I hope that this board and regional council will show leadership and courage as we plan for the 2021 budget and meaningfully engage with the reallocate WR plan. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Nabby, for a, a succinct and very cogent presentation. Much appreciated. Um, 
board members, does anyone have any questions at this point in time? Uh, Carl, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Sam, for the uh, presentation. Uh, my question uh, to you is, uh, have you um, presented something similar to our members of Parliament, provincially and federally, uh, as well? Because uh, they're important in this equation as well, as I'm sure you know, because some of the funding mm -hmm. uh, for some of the things that you outlined would come from them. So I was just wondering if you have had the opportunity to do that, Sam. Mr. Nabby? Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, through the chair, we uh, reallocate WR exists specifically around this question of the regional budget and and the what are the region police services budget. Of course, the people that are involved in reallocate WR are involved in many other uh, causes locally as well, and and we recognize that there does need to be partnership um, when it comes to actually advocating for uh, where exactly the money needs to come from. Our view is that that needs to start at the regional budget planning process. And our plan is a tool that we hope regional council would run with and collaborate with us. Uh, so we haven't specifically reached out to province or federal government level on, on reallocate WR specifically but through other organizations and through other campaigns, there, there have been advocacy uh, efforts that align very much with what we're trying to do. Councillor Kiefer, do you have another question? No, uh, thank you, Sam, for that. And uh, I would uh, urge you though, to continue advocating the, the provincial and federal representatives as well. Thank you for your presentation again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I see no further questioners. So uh, thank you again for your uh, intervention. Um, and for your concern for the greater good of the community. It's one we all share. Thank you. Um, colleagues, everybody received correspondence. Does anyone have any uh, questions or comments on the correspondence that we've received? Seeing none, um, Police Services Board Reports, Delegation of Authority, and I will turn this over to Jill Eggleton. Thank you, Chair Redmond, members of the board. Um, so agenda item 11.1 .1 is regarding the delegation of authority. So this item is coming back to the board again this month. Um, this is in response to the board approving a motion at the April board meeting, delegating its authority to the chair and vice chair during the pandemic, providing a mechanism to allow for decision-making by the board related to urgent matters when they need to be made in between regularly scheduled board meetings. Uh, the approved delegation of authority was time limited and would be repealed by the board once no longer required. Uh, so it is coming back uh, to the board again today to confirm if the board wishes to keep this mechanism in place uh, or whether to repeal. Uh, just to note, since the motion was passed, the chair and vice chair have not been required to exercise this delegation of authority. Thank you, colleagues. As we will all recall, this is a standing um, agenda item. Jill, do we need a motion? We have in the past, yes. Past okay, so I would ask for a motion that this extraordinary uh, delegation of authority remain. And again, we will review it at our uh, December meeting. I'll move by Ian, seconded by Sandy. All those in favor, please indicate by raising your hand. I think I can see everybody. That is carried, thank you. So Chief, over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, Chair Redmond and members of the board and uh, happy November. Um, uh, great opportunity uh, to discuss uh, a series of Chiefs of Police reports and a variety of our members will be joining the conversation and presentations. Uh, the first one that I'd like to uh, speak to is the Human Resources Dashboard Report. Uh, this is quarter number three. Uh, this has been an ongoing uh, report as we continue to advance and invest in our human resources, which is the, uh, in our police service, the greatest asset is that we deliver a people service, um, and hence we've uh, put some significant work. We're very proud of the leadership of uh, Ms. Molly Kimple, our uh, amazing HR director, and her team. Uh, they continue to have lots of energy and doing some incredible work, uh, particularly during the pandemic, uh, as we continue to deal with the uh, the global pandemic crisis. So uh, I'm going to flip it over to you, Molly, and I assume that you'll be sharing your screen. Um, so over to Molly. Welcome, Molly. This is for information board members. Molly, please go ahead. Great. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. 
I've got my giant air traffic controller headset on, so I just want to make sure it's working today. That's great. I'm going to attempt to share my screen now. Um, can everyone see the PowerPoint? It looks successful, Bali. I don't know if you can um, uh, position it so that it, the, um, it, it's a full screenshot. Uh, does that work? That's working. It is Excellent. successful. Excellent. Yay. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be here to present the uh, WRPS HR metrics for quarter three of 2020 uh, from July 1st to September 30th, those fabulous summer months. So we'll start off with the overall staffing uh, review here. It increased in quarter three by 15 members, 11 sworn and four civilian members. We've hired many more than that as you'll see later on in the presentation, but as you'll see in a few slides, we are still experiencing a large number of retirements that keep offsetting our hires. Authorized complement at the end of quarter three is 1,168 members. So we are still 34 positions below authorized complement. We continue to see a downward trend on average sick days, which is great. Another slight to 1.3% drop since the last quarter. And we are still projecting to be well below last year's total average sick time. So that's great news. In terms of work-related absences, we have increased slightly by two cases or 4%. We are still 15% lower than last year's year-to-date absences. Again, in this quarter, all occupational absences are occupational stress injuries. We've seen a slight decrease on the non-occupational absence side by two, so we'll take that as a win. In terms of accommodations, we've seen a little decrease of one case in accommodation since the last quarter. More importantly, our accommodations year to date are 55% less than year to date last year, which shows the incredible return on investment of our occupational health and abilities management reintegration strategies. In terms of outreach, we're still doing a ton of outreach by our incredible wellness unit. Again, we are still reaching out to any and every member potentially affected by COVID-19, in addition to members experiencing significant on-duty incidents and those who are off on sick leave. In terms of physical fitness testing, 50 pin tests were completed in quarter three now that fitness programs uh, had resumed, which is more than we had completed in quarter one or quarter two due to COVID. We are projecting another 50 to be completed before the end of the year. That's assuming our fitness programs uh, can hopefully continue. As usual, we saw a substantial increase in parental leaves taken over the summer months. This is a typical trend we see. Everyone wants to enjoy those warm and sunny summer months with their babies. Good news story here for quarter three, only 66 potential COVID exposures in this quarter compared to over 200 in quarter two. So that was a reprieve. WSIB healthcare claims were down by almost 50%, uh, less than quarter two, which was also good news. So no surprise here, uh, the 60 hazards were potential COVID exposures. Luckily, there were no positive cases uh, from WRPS members in quarter three. Retirements continue to be on the rise with a total of 33 year to date. From last year at this time, uh, that's a 14% increase. Two thirds of retirements continue uh, to be on the sworn side. In terms of resignations, we're holding steady at four year to date on the civilian side, whereas sworn resignations are down from 11 mm. last year to seven this year so far. We've hired 52 new recruits so far this year, which is 13% more than last year at this time. We are aiming to hire another 14 or so before the end of this year for the January 2021 OPC intake. Our uniform recruiting team has done an incredible job of safely recruiting during the pandemic. 
On the civilian professional side, 40 hires were made during quarter three. So that includes part-time, temporary and full-time staff. 17 vacancies remain, all are replacement vacancies except for one new position. And finally, uh, in terms of our sworn transfer process, 24 transfers were completed in the third quarter. 16 were left to complete as of the end of September. This new process allows members to compete for specialized positions within the service that they're interested in, allowing equitable opportunities for all. And that's it for the quarter three dashboard, another incredible quarter of accomplishments uh, despite a global pandemic. We'll see you again before we know it for the quarter four results and the 2020 year in review. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Molly. Uh, great um, walk through this past quarter. I see no questions. Does any board member have a question? And this was for information. So we'll go on to a request for proposal, um, Director of Psychological Services. Thanks so much, uh, Chair Redmond. Uh, uh, this one will also, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Molly. This one does have a recommendation. Uh, it's in relation to an RFP that the police service has issued uh, to support our internal uh, wellness and psychological support services. Uh, but to take you through the details of the report, uh, we have Ms. Molly Kimpel. And from a procurement perspective, we also have Ms. Kirsten Hand uh, as well. So over to uh, Molly and Kirsten. Take it away, Molly. Welcome, Kirsten. Great, thank you very much. Uh, no slideshow for this one, um, but I will, uh, I think there is a report attached to it, but as outlined in the WRPS 2018 to 2020 operations plan, we as a service are committed to the safety and well-being of our members and remain committed to building a culture of employee wellness. We continue to make mental health and wellness an organizational priority. The proposed in-house psychological services are to support and enhance the mental health and well-being of our members. This firm will conduct pre-employment psychological assessments, safeguarding assessments in and out of high-risk work units, as well as manage the coordination of our cutting-edge annual wellness check-in program. In-house psychological services will allow for us to better handle any internal mental health crisis situations, as we would have someone on site to assess fitness for duty, as well as conduct any psychoeducational sessions after a significant call for service. On-site service sends a strong message to members that mental health is a priority. It also allows us to do more assessments in a quicker and consistent time frame. It provides us with greater consistency and in-house expertise. And bonus, the estimated costs came in under budget. And I'll let Kirsten Hand speak to the procurement process. It is important to note, however, that this is only part one of two proposed components to a comprehensive in-house psychological services program. This part addresses the clinical assessment side, but we still need to address the therapeutic side. Perhaps, or we in one day could have on-site counseling available, psychologi psychologists riding with members, attending divisions, people that would be available to talk to members, uh, to a member, mental health professional in real time. But today's request is to solely address the clinical and educational piece so that we can assess and monitor and ensure members' mental health and wellness throughout their career. So I'm happy to answer any questions about the proposal and I don't know, I'll pass it off to Kirsten Hand if she wants to speak more to the procurement side. Welcome, Kirsten. Good morning. Um, so just quickly, the reason why this is coming to the board today is um, in accordance with our bylaw, if we don't have three proponents that have bidded on an RFP, then it must come to the board for approval. Um, so as you can see in the report, um, two, we had two submissions. Unfortunately, one was disqualified. Therefore, it left us um, the, the remaining bid um, was evaluated. Um, and we've got a motion before you today to accept um, the bid from um, Callian Limited that, as Molly mentioned, um, is within budget. Thank you. So I, oh, go ahead, Ian. So when I read the report, um, is this someone that's going to be on site on a, on a permanent basis so we're contracting out? Or is it a consultant that's going to be available online? It wasn't clear to me whether this is a body that's going to be um, uh, like a person that's going to be on site. Like, is that, is that, is that what this is? Cause it's a, uh, and, and, is, and is it a one-year contract? So the 160 odd thousand, whatever it is, 
is a one-year contract. Is that correct? Uh, Molly, do you want to go ahead? Kirsten's nodding, but you go ahead, Molly, answer the hard part. Yeah, I think uh, I'll let Kirsten answer the contract piece. I believe it is for one year. Yeah, um, it's a it's a firm, but they they do have a dedicated psychologist that could be on site. So we have to work out those details with them. But they've assured us that they could have someone on site. Uh, but it is a contract. So you know, with COVID and everything, a, a lot of these assessments have moved to a remote model. But um, Callian has assured us that they could have a psychologist and it's uh, the, the person that they have uh, on deck is named in the report, um, but uh, they have assured us that they could have someone on site for as much as we need. Thank you. Kirsten, do you want to speak to the contract part of it? Yeah, so it's a one year contract. Um, so the value in the motion relates to one year um, with an additional three year um, option to renew. So um, and, and so that's that's the important part. I mean, is less to do with with COVID because that that I mean that's one of the the issues around in person anyways. But but with, is the idea that that um, mental health and we've talked about this just as a as an employer uh, of the service, but also the increasing calls for service in mental health. So I, I guess I'm just wondering: is this going to be? Um, do we contemplate this being a permanent position of some description, and, and whether it's contracted out or hired uh, so i don't know maybe that's more for the chief is this uh, is this is this a uh, is this meant to be a, a pilot to say is this useful for the force and then if so how would it get incorporated because our responsibility as an employer is to make sure that that mental health piece is taken care of for for uh, the employees chief go ahead thanks very much uh, chair redmond uh, through you to mr mclean uh, Yes, I mean, this is part of our larger wellness strategy. And uh, later on in uh, one of my presentations, you'll see uh, I'll be presenting Wellness 2.0, uh, which is our next iteration of where we're going as an organization. Um, we've put a lot of effort and thank you to the board for your support. We've been able to expand our capacity and human resources, including the launch of a wellness unit, um, a wellness committee, which provides uh, advocacy and an advisory committee to Ms. Kimpel, our HR director and the senior leadership team. Um, Last year, the Chief Coroner of Ontario, Dr. Dirk Heyer, um, worked with a series of consultants uh, from across the country on uh, death within policing by suicide, as well as the overall culture of wellness within policing, uh, based on some of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, we see the social unrest, we see the uh, consistent uh, policing in the media, uh, et cetera, and, and the significant oversight and accountability, all which we accept, all which are important parts uh, but we also recognize that we also require and need uh, the wellness supports to go along with that. We saw an expansion in our collective bargaining uh, uh, for uh, external psych psychological support. Uh, we've also launched a, a significant program, a safeguarding program, where members are heading towards uh, specialized units where there's significant impact, uh, significant uh, large-scale traumatic events, uh, large-scale challenging events. Um, and we set baselines when the member arrives in the unit. And then based on the unit, it could be quarterly, biannually, or annually, where they do mandatory uh, follow-ups with the psychologist. One of our challenges was processing that, was getting enough access to our external psychologist. Um, equally, uh, thanks to this police services board, we're the first service that has actually mandated that every single member <laughs> annually will go for a mental health health first aid checkup. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, 1100 members requiring access to a psychologist and of course, uh, booking appointments and getting that all sorted out. And so the dialogue internally, and we did actually consult with other police services who have uh, psychologists on staff. Um, our first step in, in experimenting with this was to go with a contract uh, to see whether or not uh, we could evaluate the program, we can evaluate usage, we can evaluate our return on investment. So do we have members who are subjected to um, trauma, uh, vicarious trauma, uh, major incidents, cumulative impact of occupational stress injuries. Uh, are we able to reintegrate? Are we able to return to work uh, after uh, a fatal uh, and or uh, a, an encounter where there's a, a shooting? We have a shooting protocol where members are actually go through a decompression period, uh, reintegration. Like we really, over the last five years, significantly enhanced our work, but we weren't in a 
a psychologist in the sense of, okay, do we go down this road or do we actually um, take an evaluative perspective? And hence the reason for the contract. You'll note that uh, Kirsten and team have built in a series of extensions. Uh, so if we don't have the necessary data, we don't have the necessary feedback or usage, we can extend or it's going well. It gives, gives the board and the, and the employer and the service the opportunity to extend to see where we go with the program. So uh, we will report to, to the board um, on how this is going. Their goal is investing in our people. Our goal is keeping our people healthy. Uh, we have fiduciary responsibilities under the Employment Standards Act, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And I think that this really forms a part of it. And we join a cadre of the Big 12 in Ontario that are moving in this direction. So it's a great response to the Chief Corners report. It shows action, it shows leadership. Um, and it continues to chip away at the stigma within our culture. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Tony, go ahead. Thanks, through you, Madam Chair. Um, two points, just one is more of a clarification. The, the recommendation, what I read here is this, this is for a two-year contract. It's not a one-year contract. I, I thought both of you had indicated that this is a one-year contract. I understand what I read in the is, is there a difference? Are you are you changing the recommendation? I'm just more for clarification. No, sorry, that's my error. Your error, error, sorry. Uh, it is a two year contract commencing Jan 1st, 2021 to December 31st, 2022, with an option renew for three additional one year periods. Uh, the 162 400 is per year. The other question, if, if you could just indulge me. If, when, when I kudos on on taking these steps for uh, mental well-being of, of our uh, of our service the question is some of these issues are not always short term they will require time and, and a lot of support services how does this integrate with the actual members own personal benefits where maybe they have opportunity how do the two come together so something traumatic could happen on site they get initial uh, response and support maybe from the director and these services, but I can't see this happening over a long period of time. At some point, the baton must be transferred over to someone who may need to provide a lot more robust uh, support. Does this overlap or work with the, the, um, the, the personal benefits of the in individuals? Chief, I see you've taken your, mic your mute off. Would you like to jump in? Yeah, so thanks very much, uh, uh, Tony, for the uh, inquiry. Um, our members do have, um, through the collective bargaining process, uh, access to psychological benefits, employee assistance, peer support, etc. Um, and this is intended to actually, uh, as an employer, we have a fiduciary duty. Uh, and so we've actually built procedures around uh, certain incidences where there's mandatory uh, directed uh, access to psychological services. So right now we use a series of contract psychologists that um, our members have access to, uh, but also for their own personal access, we have a, a cadre of psychologists in and around the greater Toronto area that do a lot of work with policing where we'll do referrals, et cetera. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we'll work with, uh, with our uh, delegated psychologists is how do we interweave the wellness plan for the member? Because you are correct at times, it, some, it could be short-term, mid-term, long-term. So how do we interweave both? Um, but at the heart of all of this, we do have a fiduciary responsibility uh, for on-duty incidences to provide continuous care and the continuum of public, you know, public support and health care to the member. And so that individual would be a part of that. We also have a uh, registered nurse who is assigned to our wellness team that works with Ms. Kimple's team. We also have a uniform member uh, who provides support and peer support. So it's a really, it's a we're building a continuity of, of different accesses and different focal points, uh, but many of these will be directed by the employer to ensure that the individual member receives support, but we'll also use for our wellness programs, our mental health first aid programs, and all the other various work that we're doing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen, go ahead. Thank you. My, my, I had two questions. You, Tony, already took the first one, which was just the same clarification that he had related to the length of term of the contract. Um, I... I just want to say I strongly support this. I was delighted to hear Molly talk about the fact that this is only phase one in terms of 
uh, what you are looking at in sort of a two-part plan. So this is more the evaluation piece and then there's going to be additional supports. I think right now, and the chief has talked about this a little bit, I've heard uh, you chief talk an awful lot about mental health and the need for strengthening mental health supports in the community. I've also heard you talk about strengthening it within the service as well. And I think in terms of some of the focus groups that we were at, I was with you know social service providers talking about mental health supports and counseling supports. I know that there is an increasing need in the and uh, use in the community of that. So I think anything we can do to cement and solidify individuals who are available for members of our service to access and have people to talk to and support um, during this time right now is just a smart move to make to make sure those supports are available. So I look forward to the second part of this in subsequent board meetings as well, because, uh, you know, this goes hand in hand with uh, retention and recruitment and jobs becoming in the service becoming harder as our community needs become more challenging and more complicated. So making sure I know the chief talks about it as a, you know, obligation, but I also know him well enough to know that this is just something he personally believes that we need to make sure we've got those supports in place for people, even if we weren't legally obligated to do it um, as well. Thanks. Thank you. Those are all really good comments. I have to say, I had sort of the same reaction as Karen did. Molly, can you talk just briefly referenced uh, phase two and how that would come forward? Sure. So the, the second phase would be the therapeutic, the therapeutic side or the counseling side. So it's very important to keep the assessment side and the therapeutic side uh, separate. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we wanted to do this in a staged approach. So the second phase could look like uh, potentially a series of contracted psychologists that um, Right now, we have a, a vetted list of psychologists that our members can use. Those psychologists have been on ride-alongs, have experience uh, with uh, law enforcement, uh, often specialize in things like PTSD. And so the idea would be that we could have some of those people around, physically around, whether it's in an office down the hall uh, so people can pop in, whether they're out at the divisions, um, providing training to our members, uh, riding along with officers. Um, the idea is that it's probably uh, requires more than one psychologist. Um, so perhaps maybe a contracted model, but that's certainly at the forefront of this second step is to, to have people uh, available mental health professionals so that our members have someone to talk to real time. But we want to keep that separate from this director of psychological services that is um, uh, making assessments in terms of uh, whether people are suitable for positions or are mentally able to move uh, from one high risk area to another and that sort of thing. Thank you for that clarification. I think it's really important and I, I would concur with all of my colleagues on the board. I think it, it's very exciting. So we have a motion before us. I see no more uh, speakers or questioners. And uh, that is to accept the proposal for the Director of Psychological Services for a contract period of two years with the option of one-year renewals, um, three one-year renewals. Um, do I have someone who wants to move that? Moved by Tony, seconded by Rosita. All those in favor, please indicate with your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you, colleagues. That is necessary and very exciting. Um, 12.3 is intellig intelligent notes. Chief, back to you. Thanks very much, uh, Chair Redman. Um, this is a ongoing, uh, as you know, recently, uh, the Police Services Board, we've realigned intelligence notes from an annual report to a quarterly report uh, to sync with our uh, regulated interactions and through 2021 you'll see it sync with our use of force uh, data reporting and race-based data collection reporting as we continue to expand uh, uh, quarterly reporting and so uh, this is the first iteration and uh, joining us uh, to provide uh, an overview and take you through the report uh, we have our manager of strategic services Ms. Mark Glode and our uh, research analyst who does all of our data collection around race-based data uh, intelligence notes, regulated interactions, uh, Ms. Delise, Denise Lowe is also with us on the line. So over to you, Margaret and Denise. Welcome, Margaret, go ahead. Good morning, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to attempt to share my screen here for Denise. Um, we don't have a formal presentation prepared. We were just going to speak 
to the board package. So I also have uh, Jill on standby if this doesn't work exactly as planned. So um, if you could just bear with me a moment. Share. How is that working? Are you seeing the uh, page 163 in red at the top right? Well done, we see it. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay, Denise, take it away. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, I, my apologies, I don't have video capabilities today. So, oh, no, no voice. Oh. No, you're fine, Denise, we can hear you, you go ahead. Oh, okay, uh, sorry, my apologies. I thought I was uh, muted or something. Um, yeah, so I don't have video capabilities today. So I'm just going to be operating uh, through audio only. Um, so as uh, the chief has mentioned, uh, this is the first iteration of our quarterly intelligence note report. And I just wanna talk a little bit about the structure of the report itself before I move on to the content. So you'll notice that it's structured in a very similar way to the regulated interactions report where we have the main report first and then we go through a series of key indicators and then you'll see the, in the attachment, that's where all the graphs of the indicators are. So there's a couple of items that I have left out of the quarterly report, um, namely the repeated contacts, proportional analysis, and any hotspotting analysis. And the sole reason for this is that it's, um, it's a better approach to look at those three things in particular on a holistic level. So I will be focusing on those three items in the annual report, which is coming up in 2021. So those uh, three items are still on my list to report on. They're just going to be moved on uh, to an annual basis. Uh, for now. So about the actual intelligence note report for the third quarter, uh, in this quarter, uh, our officers have completed 116 unique intelligence notes on 188 unique subjects. Um, 184 of those subjects are uh, actual persons. 34% um, of the intelligence notes this time around are, are on persons that do not have any permanent residences in the, the region or uh, or do not have any per, uh, permanent residence in the region. And by location, uh, most of our intelligence notes took place in zone N6. Uh, by perceived race, individuals who were perceived right, uh, white accounted for 66% of all person subjects recorded in intelligence notes for this quarter. And this is followed by individuals who were perceived black, which is at 19% and Arab at 5%. Uh, by perceived gender, uh, 139 persons were perceived as male, which accounts for 76% of all the intelligence notes that were conducted in this quarter. Um, so barring any questions, this is kind of the first pass of this report. So if you have any questions, I will take them now. Thank you very much. Don't see any questions. I guess one of the questions that, that I would have is uh, these statistics are, are sort of interesting, but they don't always have context. Do we have the capability of providing additional context? Is this something we might see in the future or maybe at the annual report? Denise? Yeah, you'll definitely see a lot more context in, in the annual report. Unfortunately, I do not conduct uh, any of the intelligence notes myself, and our intelligence uh, analyst is actually the one who's in the background helping me uh, prepare for, for these reports. So um, any information for context, I would have to consult her and uh, request for her expertise about how to interpret things, and that's how the, um, we can get the context into the report. So. For myself, I can only speak on the numbers basis, but in, in what we try to do in the annual reports is that we try to take a deeper dive into uh, what, what do these numbers mean and, and why they are the way they are. But as far as the quarterly reports go, they're kind of more of a descriptive focus, so we know what the picture is like on a quarterly basis. Thank you. Chief, do you want to jump in? Thanks very much, Chair Redmond. I'll just add to Denise's comments. Um, as you're aware, the board has invested in uh, a significant investment in data analysis and work behind the scenes that we do. We currently have a series of records management systems, as well as computer aided dispatch systems, um, and a series of databases um, that are, you know, over time have become somewhat uh, dated and aged. Um, and Margaret uh, Glode and Superintendent Chris Goss are leading an internal project on business intelligence and analytics. Uh, which will allow us to dive deeper 
to provide the board with enhanced uh, information, uh, look at connecting all of the different processes that we do as a police service to specific investigations. Uh, we'll be able to monetize uh, investigations. Uh, we'll be able to look at many, many different pieces by actually uh, working with an external provider that will really uh, pull all of our databases together to give us much more robust capacity at data analysis. The, the secondary piece to this is a project that uh, Deputy Crowell and uh, Ms. Kate Richardson, along with Inspector Jason Boucher, continue to work on with Margaret and team. And that is around uh, enhanced internal uh, race-based data collection, uh, working with external academics, as well as the work that we're doing with other police services uh, so we've engaged with the Toronto Police Service who have a significant race-based data collection project ongoing, uh, as well as working with other uh, police services in Canada as we start advancing the, uh, the data analytics and the work that we're doing, which is extremely important in many facets um, to also bring context and explanatory, uh, as well as good governance uh, for the board. Uh, so stay tuned. I think as we, this is fairly new for us. Um, and, and clearly you're seeing some of the uh, capabilities and the capacity issues that we have uh, with our internal systems. But I think as we move forward into 2021 uh, and we roll out uh, throughout 2021, uh, you'll see a much uh, enhanced product. Uh, so the work that we're doing, uh, full credit to Denise and team, uh, the work that they do to pull this together is pretty significant. Uh, so hopefully that also provides some insight and context to where we're going and what the future looks like uh, around data analysis. Thank you, Chief, for that information. Uh, Carl, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. It's, it's uh, Thanks for that uh, report there, uh, Denise. But when you were sharing the screen, um, I don't know if we were supposed to see more than just the, uh, the front page there, but uh, I wasn't getting anything beyond the last thing I have on my page there when you shared it was the recommendation and it didn't show the recommendation. So just wondering if that's stuck or if that's not working. Oh. It's actually for information. That's what the recommendation, that's what comes under recommendation is for information. But good catch, yeah. Carl. Was, it, was, there, was there any more, Madam Chair, or just that? Uh, well, there's a summary. I, um, I don't know if I got one page. I'm just, wondering, I'm just wondering if my screen was stuck. That's all I'm saying, I'm asking. Uh, no, everybody's screen's there. So you're, it, good catch. But it is for information. Thank you. Okay. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. Sandy. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Chief, for talking about um, uh, bringing the data together and, and maybe some ro more robust uh, reporting that, that connects all the pieces. I think that's one of my questions is uh, regarding time to collect the data and how that's collected. So I'm assuming that uh, either you do or you're working towards um, ease of collection so that um, the, our officers can and spend their time doing what we need them to do and, and not a lot of paperwork. Who'd like to take this one? Marg, do you want to take it or Chief or Deputy Crowell? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, we actually have a, a process where uh, intelligence notes and regulated interactions are uh, essentially electronic uh, and hit into the system. Uh, where the, the work demand actually gets created is on the back end. It's uh, Margaret and team. Uh, as to when they how they access and pull data and extrapolate data from the data sets because uh, there's various different pieces. Um, so at the front line, we've actually turned this into a fairly manageable system. Um, there are some challenges with the different record management systems and there's likely some work to be done around that. But uh, uh, you know, I think that at the front end, we're actually doing okay. Um, it's really in the back end where we need to enhance our information technology and our infrastructure um, to be much more less uh, manual and much more automated. And that's really the work that Margaret uh, is doing with her team uh, is to how do we pull all the systems together. Um, we're just in the process of finalizing that project charter. Um, it, the board has approved uh, the actual uh, budgetary amount and request for proposal, et cetera. We're now working with the company. Uh, this company that uh, the board uh, approved as part of the RFP does significant work with the York Regional Police Service Chief, did we lose you? So I, I think we've lost the chief momentarily, or are we frozen? 
I'm I'm good this time. I was afraid it was me. <laughs> no, I think it's just the chief. Okay, thank you. So um, we will go on. Tony, you have a question. Karen, yeah. sorry, could I could I do a follow up and and the chief might not be able to. I don't know if anyone can answer it at this point, but okay, um, go ahead. Chief's back anyway, Sandy. So feel free. Thanks. Sorry, I, I got kicked out. My apologies. Um, my my. Uh, my second question is regarding social determinants of health, and uh, the data that, that you collect is related um, more to policing, and I wonder um, where that connect comes with other social determinants of health. I know we've had a lot of call for, uh, for paying attention to race, but there are other social determinants of health that, that um, could be linked uh, all together, especially when you're pulling all of that information together. Great question, Sandy. Chief, you're back. Do you want to answer that? or? I am back. Uh, so the social determinants of health are a key part of our overall dialogue in addressing uh, the roots of root causes of crime. And um, I think it speaks to all of us. I think uh, we all agree that uh, upstream prevention and addressing the social determinants of health will lead to healthier outcomes, safer outcomes of the community. Um, the intelligence notes are very much uh, investigative based. Um, and so you'll note uh, that, you know, we could, uh, so I think it was the, the comment around Chair Redmond around context to this, um, we can provide significant context uh, and will be able to provide significant context. So there's, you know, passive observation, uh, there's personal conduct, uh, there's actually uh, citizen generated information, but you'll note in this particular one, uh, the majority of our intelligence notes were through uh, passive observation. So work that we were doing, uh, following up on criminal investigations, criminal association, uh, crime activity, human trafficking activity, drug activity. Um, and so right now our system does not track, uh, we have a lot of data in our system around uh, gender. Obviously we're moving towards our whole race-based data strategy, but we don't capture some other pieces. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, uh, graduation rates, uh, employment, uh, all those different processes are not things we capture. Uh, part of a larger discussion uh, with our community through, I believe, I think the right nexus to, the, to where you're heading, Mayor Shalons is through the community uh, well-being and safety planning, uh, Waterloo well-being or whatever that looks like in the future is where I think the police service could stream data and work with our partners to actually examine and look at the, the, the actual social determinants. So we can actually, you know, do uh, geotagging. Uh, so we know what community we're in, what neighborhood we're in, which then will also provide us with socioeconomic demographics, will provide us with other information to help drive decision-making at governor's tables so we can allocate appropriately to address the challenges we're facing. Uh, but I think, you know, in policing, we deal with but really uh, a multitude of individuals, so, you know, probably three, uh, more than that, but we deal with a, an individual uh, that is fallen through and slipped through potentially the cracks of society, uh, and they find themselves either in conflict with the law or in conflict with societal norms, and so the police service gets called. Um, we definitely know that there's a better way to support and to ensure that those individuals get on their feet rather than policing, rather than the judicial system. I think we all agree on that. The second individual we deal with um, is somebody that perpetrates crime in our community um, and that they may be beyond certain levels of, of different pieces and they're just uh, involved in significant crime, uh, whether it be organized, whether it be gangs, um, and that requires police intervention. It requires at times the judicial system. Um, and then the third individual is somebody that may find themselves in contact with the police, uh, whether it be through road safety enforcement, or they're actually a witness, uh, or they're a community member looking for information. Um, so there's a variety of people that we come in contact with. Uh, but I think the data that you're trying to get to is really that marginalized population that we come in contact with, and how do we get them better services other than policing? Uh, I think we all agree on that, and there's a larger dialogue. We're prepared to share our data, uh, the, the, and I think the work that Margaret's doing in accessing the data and pulling it out of the system uh, is really where we're heading in the future. So stay tuned for that. Councillor Schatz, any further questions? Okay, thank you. Tony, go ahead. I just want to echo that um, that these reports I realize are in their infancy, but it's a great step 
and a great investment if we can continue to uh, look into this and make these reports a little bit more robust. Um, you know, one thing that struck me was, and hopefully as we go down the line, um, is there's about 18% of all of those individuals that were contacted um, are outside of our region. And then there's about another 17% on top of that, which is unknown. So 66% overall are from our region. So that gives us a good basis to try to build reports of what are the, what are the drivers of, uh, 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 of certain instances within our community. But there's 34% that are not within our community. Uh, and they may skew how we see things. So I think as we build on this reporting, I think we're going to we're going to have some better dashboards and some better insights into uh, into our community. So that's all I really wanted to say, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, Tony, I, I think you may, you raise a really important point. And the other reality is this is in its infancy. And the more data we get, the larger database we have, we can look at trends over time. And I think it will probably be more instructive than a very small cohort. Uh, Chief, the one question I had, um, We've talked about the academics uh, coming into play. And I don't know if this is a question for you or Marg or Denise. Um, have we um, engaged those academics and are they looking at this information already or is this something that's going to happen? Yes, well, thanks very much, Chair Redmond. Uh, uh, in short, uh, yes, but I'm gonna turn it over to Deputy Crowell uh, who has uh, okay. been that project. So over to you, Mark. Thank you, Chief, uh, Chair Redmond, members of the board. Uh, in brief, uh, we heard last month from Kate Richardson, who is leading our uh, race-based data collection strategy, and we are engaging in some preliminary discussions with uh, external academic partners, uh, both locally and beyond. And uh, they have has had some preliminary look uh, at the use of force data and also our regular interactions and uh, the data that you see today to provide some context. So uh, we hope uh, to have an update uh, as we promised uh, in January with some context for where we're heading to build a robust robust approach. Um, the early um, sort of take on it is that we're still dealing with very small data sets. Uh, as we've uh, previously discussed, um, each one of these is uh, you know, single interactions related to um, criminal investigations. So there is some caution with drawing firm conclusions uh, based on uh, some of the crude and clunky uh, arrangements we have right now and uh, we look forward to providing a more robust and comprehensive report to the board and a, a path forward that will shape uh, a lot of our, our future reports to the board. Thank you Deputy Crowell and, and again I think this is really an important um, metric that we continue to uh, measure and to um, track over time so thank you for that. Uh, that report was for information and it's really pertinent and good information so thank you. Uh, the next is police reported crime stats in Canada 2019. And Chief, is this, are you going to lead off on this one? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, again, this is an annual report that uh, we do report to the Police Services Board on. It's been slightly delayed uh, based on the pandemic and Stats Canada uh, releasing the report. So we are dealing with 2019 data towards the end of 2020. Uh, so some of this information will not come as a surprise to the board as we have reported on local context. But uh, as the board is aware, uh, Margaret sits on a national committee uh, sponsored by the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, as well as the Stats Canada uh, poll list, so which looks at uniform crime reporting, crime severity. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Marg uh, to take you through the report. Okay, thank Welcome, you. Mark. Thank you, good morning again. Um, I am going to try to share my screen again. I, I was scrolling last time, but it sounds like it wasn't working properly. So um, maybe we'll, just let, we'll me... let you know this time if it doesn't scroll. Okay, okay? <laughs> okay thank you. So um, thank you again, Chief, for uh, setting the stage here. Um, at the October, the previous PSB meeting, um, we did release the WRPS criminal offense summary that goes into our annual report each year. Um, that one is based on an internal count of all the uniform crime reported or the UCR violations. Um, since that date, on October 29th, Stats Canada or the C uh, Canadian Centre for Justice Statistics released their annual report of police reported crime statistics in Canada. It was much delayed due to COVID, 
Um, but now at this point in time, um, the data is available and some of their reports are available on their website and it offers a, an opportunity um, to look at comparable information, um, data that's available by Census Metropolitan Area, Municipal Police Service, um, by province and as well nationally. So it offers a lot more context to the crime stats that we've been looking at prior. Mark, should it be scrolling? Oh, there it is, great. Yes, okay. now, <laughs> now it's scrolling, okay. Okay, excellent, thank you. I'm going to just jump ahead to the graphs here. Um, what we've done in this report is we've gone through the data and we've we've looked at the past five years um, for Waterloo Regional Police Service, as well as the large, the other large 12 municipal police services across Ontario, which is usually our best comparators. We've also included um, the province of Ontario and Canada, just for some context here. So the first graph um, that I wanted to draw your attention to is the total crime rate. Um, the crime rate is that traditional measure of the actual volume of police reported crime per 100,000 population. Um, the total rate is composed of Offenses grouped into three main categories, which include violent offenses or offenses against persons, um, crimes against property, and then the third category is the other criminal code violations. So this first graph is everything all combined together. Now across Canada in 2019, the total police reported crime rate increased by 7%. Um, and in Waterloo Region, um, you can see from the graph that the total crime rate decreased slightly by minus 4%. Um, it to a, a rate of 5,264 crimes per 100,000 persons in our community. Despite this decrease, however, of the 12 large municipal police services across Ontario, you can see that the overall crime rate in Waterloo Region continues to be the fourth highest in 2019. So if we look at each of those categories individually, this next graph looks at the violent crime rate per 100,000. This is where we're seeing the most significant change in our community. Waterloo Region's violent crime rate rose 10% in 2019, and it is now the highest of the other 12 large municipal police services in the province. It is also um, uh, above both the provincial and the national rates. The property crime rate um, decreased slightly by 4%. Um, but it is also the fifth highest of the other 12 municipal police services in Ontario. And when we look at other criminal code uh, offenses, we also see a decrease by about 22%. However, we are still the fifth highest among these other municipal police services across Canada. And you will see when looking back at all three of these categories of crime rates, over the last five years, Waterloo Region has remained above the median level of, of the other main municipal police services in Ontario. So the one um, of note that we wanted to bring your attention to is the rate of firearms violations um, in figure five. So the firearm related violations include um, a number of different uh, offenses such as discharging a firearm with intent, using a firearm in the commission of an offense and pointing a firearm. So Waterloo Region saw a 46% increase in the rate of firearms violations between 2018 and 2019 and brings the rate uh, to 7.6 firearm violations per 100,000 persons. This rate is now above the median for the other large 12 municipal police services in Ontario. Moving on uh, to the crime severity indices. So the crime severity index or the CSI for short is a measure of both police reported crime that reflects the volume of the crime as well as the relative seriousness of the individual offenses. These indices, um, they exist also for three slightly different categories, a total um, CSI as well as one for violent crime. And the third one includes uh, property crime and um, other criminal code offenses or nonviolent crime. So in looking at the total CSI uh, graph here in figure six, um, in 2019, across Canada, the national CSI increased for the fifth year in a row by 5% across Canada. In Waterloo Region, our total CSI decreased slightly. Um, it went down from 73.8 to 73.0. 
Um, according to Stats Canada, when they get into all the, the, the different violations that are driving um, this index, the violations that contributed to our local change in the CSI index included a decrease in break and entering, as well as administration of justice violations. Those are things such as failure to comply with conditions, um, fail to appear, breach of probation, things like that. So although um, we did have a slight decrease in our local index, uh, you can see that we are, the overall CSI is still the fourth highest of these other 12 large municipal police services um, across Ontario. Um, and it is also higher than the provincial CSI. So again, uh, looking at the violent CSI is where we see some significant difference. Um, in 2019, the overall volume and severity of violent crime across Canada was 7% higher than the previous year. According to Stats Canada, some of the driving forces in this national increase were increases in child pornography, uttering threats, and level one sexual assaults. The violent CSA in, in our community rose more significantly than the national trend. We were up by about 9%. Our index rose from 80 in 2018 to 87.4 in 2019. Um, as you can see in figure seven here, Waterloo Region's violent CSI increased for the fifth, um, or it, it was the fifth highest among Ontario's large municipal services. Um, it rose from the fifth to the fourth highest, sorry. Are we frozen? Mark, are you frozen? Tony, you're not frozen. We're back. Okay, uh, sorry, did everybody get frozen or was it just us? Sorry, I was kicked out again. Right, Mark, are you able to continue? <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're, you're, we're all, I think we're all back for the time being, okay. so please continue. Okay, oh gosh, sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, um, I was back on figure eight, the nonviolent crime severity index. Um, the, the national nonviolent CSI increased across Canada by 4% in 2019. Um, nationally, the primary offenses contributing to this increase were fraud and shoplifting. In Waterloo Region, we saw a slight decrease in our nonviolent CSI. Um, but we did again, rank, uh, our rank increased from fifth to fourth highest um, compared to the other 12 large municipal police services in 2019. Some of the uh, more significant uh, drivers in behind this index, um, things that went down in our region were break and enters, motor vehicle thefts, thefts under 5,000 and thefts from motor vehicles. Um, but the drivers that increased it slightly were shoplifting um, as well as identity theft. And we also continue to have a steady and frequent um, incident of fraud and mischief offenses in our region as well. So I won't get into each of the violent uh, clearance rates. There's three different graphs here, um, but what just to explain a little bit more what these are, clearance rates um, represent the portion of criminal incidents that are solved by police. Stats Canada has created a weighted clearance rate similar to the crime severity index so that it gives greater weight to uh, clearances of crimes that are more severe. Um, we have total weighted clearance rates. We also have a weighted clearance rate for just violent crime as well as one for nonviolent crime. Um, and you can see where WRPS fares in each of these graphs. Um, the general trend has been that um, our Clearance rate is a little bit below the median level for clearing crime. 
Um, and in, as in previous years, our weighted clearance rates for all three of these categories has declined in uh, 2019 by a range of about eight to 10%. I'll just draw your attention to uh, one more graph here um, in figure 12. In uh, 2017, you will recall uh, Stats Canada and the policing community committed to standardizing the collection and the release of unfounded data. Um, among all crimes reported to the police, a certain number are deemed or cleared as unfounded. Um, the definition of clearing an incident as unfounded is if it has been determined through a police investigation that the offense reported did not occur, nor was it attempted. So figure 12 is, is part of that commitment to ongoing reporting. And it shows the percentage of sexual assaults uh, classified as level one that were cleared as unfounded between 2017 and 2019. Nationally, the proportion of sexual offense cleared as unfounded decreased from 14% to 10% in 2019. And you will see um, similar to the national trend, this has also decreased in Waterloo Region. Uh, the sexual assaults uh, deemed as level one um, cleared as unfounded de uh, dec has declined 15% down to 6% in 2019. So that is a, a very positive mood. I think a lot of that is also clarifying um, the, the definition of what it means, um, increased communication and um, cleaning up some of the clearance status uh, types and availability. Um, but then just to wrap up, um, there are, as you know, many factors that influence police reported crime, uh, such as the community's trust in reporting to police, the ease and the services available to victims when reporting, available police resources, priorities, crime prevention measures, targeted enforcement practices, and other avenues of reporting crime that do not necessarily get relayed to police. These police statistics are important indicators, one of many, um, of the ongoing change in landscape in our community. This ongoing comparative analysis aligns with our services goals to reduce crime, to enhance our ability to investigate crime and to conduct victim-centered investigations. So thank you for the opportunity to present this today. I hope it's provided a little bit more context um, and welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Mark, for a great presentation and shouldering through a few technological wrinkles. Um, you didn't miss a beat. Uh, <laughs> Carl, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now thank you're you, unmuted. Madam, thank, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, um, Mark, for that uh, very informative uh, presentation. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is the slide you showed on firearms, uh, Mark. Does that include uh, taser tasers on in in that information? That's my first question. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good question. Um, I I don't have the exact answer for that. I'd have to dig a little bit further. My understanding is that a taser is considered a firearm, but I I would have to clarify for sure. Okay, um, I, I can wait for that answer. That's not a problem. <laughs> Uh, this, the second thing, and I think this is maybe for the chief to address, My, uh, you know, I, I've known for a while that I think our crime indexes have gone up um, because of GTA influence uh, um, uh, on, on the situation. And, uh, and I know I've heard the chief speak a few times about it and uh, just wondered if he could comment uh, uh, the fact that the GTA does influence the crime rate in, in Waterloo Region. Chief, go ahead. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Chair Edmund. For you to Councillor Kiefer, uh, you know, clearly, as you can see in our other reports, uh, we do deal with individuals that are not from the region. We also deal with those that live within the region. Um, but uh, within the last two weeks, uh, you would have seen Deputy Hilton uh, providing leadership uh, on a Greater Toronto Area uh, project, Project Sunder, uh, which was a Toronto Police Service-led investigation that led to over 800 charges uh, more than 100 arrests uh, with uh, Greater Toronto Area organized crime, gang activity, which was interlinked across all of the regions, including our uh, community. Uh, while we're on this call, um, uh, Superintendent Fenton and Deputy Hilton have provided uh, pre-taped comments for Project Siphon, uh, 
which is a Peel Regional Police-led uh, project where we had an investigator embedded in that project because of the uh, connectivity and the ties through Waterloo Region tied to illicit drug trafficking, firearms. Um, that one will have seen uh, over uh, uh, 88 warrants, uh, over 100 arrests. The charges are still being tabulated, but uh, uh, significant amount of drug seizures, firearm seizures. And so what we're seeing from a, a policing perspective is the transient nature of crime uh, and the opportunity and much of it tied and rooted in organized crime, uh, drug activity, human trafficking, uh, stolen property and or the fencing of stolen property uh, is all tied to the larger components. And so you're seeing a lot more and continued collaborative work with all GTA police services uh, but again, to speak to some of the data analysis as we move forward in 2021, I think we'll be able to provide the board uh, with much more succinct ability to say, um, you know, these, these, these investigations or this level of crime is tied to this and that. Um, so as much as I speak to the greater Toronto area influence, I do think it's important to also recognize that, you know, uh, we have people locally who are involved in uh, significant criminal activity. Uh, we had a shooting on November 12th at 5.30 in the morning on Westwood Drive in the city of Kitchener. And yesterday, uh, our investigative team uh, brought that in part of the investigation to a, uh, a resolution uh, where they actually negotiated uh, the uh, peaceful surrender of one of the alleged suspects, that individual's from Kitchener. Um, so we know that it, it goes both ways. We know that uh, gang activity, organized crime is uh, set up and has tentacles throughout Waterloo Region but those tentacles extend beyond our borders um, and largely based on the influence of the Highway 401 corridor. Are thanks, Chief. Thanks, Madam Chair. No, thanks, Thank Madam you. Chair. Okay, uh, Sandy, go ahead. Thank you. And uh, you kind of addressed my uh, my question in the answer to Carl, but um, I'll, I'll ask it a different way in case there's anything else you want to add. Um, the, the clearance rates are down and the violent crime is up. Is there is there a connect between those two? Is, is the fact that we're having more uh, violent crime making it more complex and harder to to do the clearance? Chief? Thank you so much, uh, Chair Redmond, through you to uh, Mayor Schantz. Uh, it's a multifaceted uh, challenge. One is obviously the transient nature of crime. Uh, it comes and goes uh, and so uh, one of the reasons why we actually do intelligence notes and investigative work is to actually understand who's associating with who, uh, what criminal activity is crossing geographical borders. Uh, we partner with other police services. The second piece around uh, the decreased uh, is the complexity. Obviously, it's become much more, much more complex. And so you may see a lag in the clearance. Uh, so, for example, that number may be adjusted in 2021, uh, where we uh, solve and clear cases. Uh, you know, more than 50% of all of our investigations involve some form of technological uh, forensic examination. We do have some delays and backlog based on capacity in our service, uh, based on the demand. Uh, so, you know, every, you know, as I said, more than 50% of an investigation involves a smartphone, tablet, computer, uh, dash cam, uh, vehicle data. Um, obviously, uh, it's changed that piece. The third piece that I'll speak to around the de decreased uh, uh, clearance rate is workload, is that our investigative units are overloaded. Um, we have not kept pace as a police service uh, over the last number of years. We've seen minimal growth in our investigative area. Very shortly, you'll see a presentation that we're pivoting uh, to address uh, the crime report. We're pivoting to address community concerns. We're pivoting because we've heard from the community on how we do business, uh, but our investigators um, have a backlog. Um, and so particularly, you know, obviously we prioritize how we do work. Uh, you know, we're very proud of our break and enter and auto theft team. Uh, they've done an intelligence led approach to every investigation. Uh, their clearance rate is much improved. Uh, their tenacity and work is very much. And so they've done incredible work. Uh, but where we've seen struggles is from a robbery perspective. We have a significant number of person on person and commercial robberies. The commercial robberies are generally tied to GTA organized activity, which involves multi-jurisdictional investigations uh, and pulling that together. But the person-on-person -person robberies, uh, as the board will be aware, this year we pulled together an ad hoc robbery team and we saw our clearance and caseload rate increase uh, because we were coordinated, we were focused, and we brought to significant intelligence-led approaches. Um, and so Superintendent Fenton and Deputy Hilton have been working on pivoting as to how do we use the resources 
we have to do a better uh, approach to some of the crime we're facing. Uh, but there's so there's multifaceted to see how this is all happening. Uh, it's not just one specific area. Uh, but one of the reports that will come out through police resources in Canada is workload per officer. Uh, and you will see, the board will see, uh, that the workload for our investigative teams is higher than other uh, similar size services based on capacity. Um, and so those are some of the struggles that we're facing as an organization. We clearly prioritize crime. And so um, and most serious violations uh, go into the queue uh, and that becomes a priority. And some of the other uh, crimes, which may be based on a matrix, uh, get pushed down and, and maybe in a backlog. So for example, financial crime, um, where generally the victim is uh, business or corporate, um, you know, we're looking at anywhere from 12 to 18 months, uh, a backlog to actually addressing those investigations. And those are significantly complex. Um, and now we require, you know, financial charter accountant support, et cetera. So there's a, a variation of some of the workload issues. Deputy Hilton may have some comments to add, uh, but very shortly, you'll see how we're pivoting to answer your exact concerns. Thank you. Okay, um, Tony, go ahead. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I, I don't wanna belabor this, but I think uh, all of these reports, although alarming in some respects, are essential and enlightening, at least for me, in understanding uh, what is happening, uh, not only within our community, but on a, on a, on a more national scope. I guess I, I want to just continue to emphasize what Madam Chair had indicated, and that is the, um, the contextualization of these reports. They're great data, but in having the contextualization and then being able to bridge these reports into our strategies where, you know, as a board member, I can see what strategies we're taking and how effective these strategies are and how well we're doing in meeting our goals. I think that's where we want to end up. I, I would like to hopefully end up, but it's a road of development and evolution. So I think these are great steps, uh, although the data right now is not uh, is not uh, the most impressive or you know uh, enlightening for, or sorry, uh, the best information that I would like to see. So I just would like to just reinforce that that these are great steps, but the contextualization is going to have to be very important for us as a board. So. Thank you, Madam. Thank you for those comments, Tony. I see no um, further questions. This is a report that we're receiving from, for information. Great information. Um, thank you so much. Uh, the next agenda item is organization, organizational restructuring. This is verbal, and I assume this is what um, the chief was alluding to that uh, Deputy Hilton is part of. So chief, do you wanna start off or should we go to Deputy Hilton? Thanks very much, uh, Chair Redmond. Uh, I know Deputy Hilton will jump in at different points. Uh, um, she is uh, fighting a slight grenouille de la gorge, frog in the uh, throat. Uh, uh, so we're going to give her a little bit of a, a break. Uh, but I'll take you through some operational alignment for 2021 uh, on behalf of uh, Deputy Chief Crowell and Deputy Chief Hilton, and they can uh, jump in at various points. Uh, but this is really about uh, advancing our organization um, you know, we've been listening and we've also been looking at some of the challenges our community is facing. And uh, shortly after this report, you're also going to see our um, second iteration at the board level. There's been many iterations of a proposed uh, 2021 budget. Um, and all this is tied together. Um, we recognize that our community is changing. We recognize that Waterloo Region is the 10th largest census metropolitan area in Canada. And with that comes some significant challenges, not just within policing, but uh, stressors on our health, education, our social service networks, our uh, NGOs, our not-for-profits. Uh, many of us are facing the challenges of a growing community, a growing population, um, and unique challenges, particularly as we also navigate through a global pandemic, uh, financial challenges, and uh, social unrest. And so want to take an opportunity to take the board through some operational realignment and work that we're doing. Um, our service has a long history uh, both provincially and nationally as being a learning organization, being an organization that innovates and works with our uh, partners within our region. And we've been a leader in many different facets, particularly around community mobilization, community development, 
uh, social development. Uh, many services have always looked to Waterloo Region uh, for all of those processes. Um, and it's at the heart of our strategic plan. It's at the heart of what we do. Um, we do some things remarkably well. There's other things that we don't do so well. We're always learning. Um, and I will highlight, you know, one of the, the, the Stats Canada data that I'm very proud of uh, is the work that we've done with our external partners, particularly the Sexual Assault Support Center around our unfounded rate of sexual assaults and increasing our reporting rate. Uh, we learned a lot through the external sexual assault review. Uh, we were able to translate that learning into internal innovation and internal change, and we're now leading in the province. And so um, what you're about to see is really uh, designed by our team, a team of leaders. Um, I have the privilege of presenting this, but it's really been driven by our, our senior leadership team, uh, listening through our town halls with the police services board, uh, looking at our crime analysis and the work that's happening in our region. Uh, we've not changed structurally very much uh, in our 45 year uh, history. Uh, we've remained very uh, similar in structure, although we've obviously grown significantly uh, over the years uh, that uh, we incorporated in 1973. Our neighborhood policing and investigation is the bulk of our membership. Uh, it's where the majority of our uniform and sworn members provide service. Um, it's the uh, heart of our organization. Uh, they're the primary responders. Uh, they do significant work and work in collaboration with investigations. Um, and so you know, we've been looking at our structure. Obviously, we're primarily based uh, in patrol, in particular neighborhood policing, uh, through the three urban communities uh, with stations housed in the city of Cambridge, the city of Kitchener, the city of Waterloo, and a substation in the township of Woolwich. Uh, in Elmira. Um, and so we've been structured this way uh, with some minor tweaks. Uh, we recently, uh, as we looked at our efficiency and, and continuity model, uh, we did actually uh, close the new Hamburg division, which is a substation. And those officers are deployed out of Elmira that provide uh, policing to the four W's, as I like to refer to them as, uh, a significant large geographical area. We also have subset stations in North Dumfries at the community complex. We also have one at the Wellesley complex where officers can attend, uh, particularly working in rural communities. And so uh, what we're looking at is alignment. We're looking at the individuals that work in this area. More than 400 uh, members of our organization work in this area. Um, and we're looking at realignment. And also Deputy Chief uh, Hilton has been looking at how do we actually enhance our collaboration? How do we advance getting back to uh, a very community-based community policing model. And so uh, in 2021, uh, um, probably within the first quarter, because there's some work to be done around realignment, uh, we're, we'll be transitioning uh, to a new model in our urban divisions. Uh, we'll have a staff superintendent that will oversee uh, the operations of both investigative services, operational support and patrol. Uh, there'll be a superintendent overseeing all of the urban divisions with inspectors in each of the divisions in North, Rural, Central and South. Um, and a part of that is a new division uh, that we're launching and it's the Community Safety and Wellbeing Division. Uh, and I'll speak more to this area, but this is really around getting back uh, to our roots of community policing, community mobilization, community engagement, and very much tied to a larger strategy of engagement, of neighborhood-based engagement, uh, working with neighborhood associations, community agencies about solving, uh, preventing crime, uh, but also the long-term transition um, to looking at policing very different in our community. And I'll speak more to that. There's minor realignment in operational support. We have our emergency service and public safety branch, as well as our field support. And then of course, we have our investigative services um, uh, that has our intelligence services, as well as our criminal investigations branch. And I'll speak more to some changes um, that Superintendent Fenton and Inspector McBride, Inspector Bond, uh, and the leadership team have pulled together there in conjunction with Deputy Hilton to pivot to the new crime in our community. Uh, we've never experienced a level of firearm activity uh, ever before. Um, and so this is, over the last couple of years, very new to our service. Um, it wasn't on a regular occasion that we had shootings, uh, that we had uh, targeted shootings. Um, and so we're generally seeing a change in the flavor of the work that we do. Uh, many of our warrants and many of our drug activity is seeing a seizure of firearms. In fact, year to date, we're just at 599 firearms, either seized and or surrendered uh, year to date. So let's actually bounce into operational support, as I said, uh, there's minor alignment change here. 
uh, you can see that uh, this is a highly specialized area. Uh, we have field support, which has our uh, uh, public safety answering point, a 911 communication center that provides support across the regional Waterloo for all emergency services. It's our downstreaming. Um, they uh, are responsible for dispatching more than 310,000 calls of service a year for policing. That doesn't include downstreaming for fire and or ambulance. Um, largely led by civilian professionals who do an amazing job every single day and are the heartbeat of information coming into our organization and moving that out. This will be a significant growth area as the government of Canada has legislated the next generation of 911. And between 2021 and 2024, there'll be a requirement for significant enhancement in regional communications. Um, and there's an opportunity to look at doing business differently as a region. You'll also note uh, that recently this year, we launched our real-time operations center, which is designed to provide support to our neighborhood policing patrol divisions 24-7. Uh, and it also manages staffing. It manages uh, call-outs. It manages overtime. Um, and it also, long-term, as we move forward, it will also manage some of the data management. One of our extreme successes around diversion of calls for service from the front line has been our frontline support unit. Uh, which is a cadre of officers that manage calls online, by phone, uh, and do business differently, including going out uh, to the low threshold, low priority calls for service, uh, and managing number of those pieces and offloading the demand on frontline. Uh, there's a great opportunity here as we move forward around triaging other calls for service that may, may not necessarily need to be led by policing, uh, where we can downstream or upstream those calls for service. Uh, but it's been a significant success. Of course, we have the highly skilled emergency service and public safety branch, uh, which is comprised of special response, which is an adequacy based requirement for our service, uh, our major event team, uh, which continues to coordinate all of our large uh, public events or demonstrations. Naturally, during pandemic, things have changed and they've been supporting our emergency operations center, which is tied to our emergency planning and business continuity team. Uh, we still do significant work in partnership with the regional Waterloo around flood management. Uh, we're blessed to have the Grand River, the Nith River, and the Conestoga River in our community. But every once in a while, they still like to, Mother Nature, uh, create some chaos. And that uh, team works very closely with the region to ensure the safety of those communities and neighborhoods and citizens who live in floodplain areas. And of course, we have our road safety team, traffic services. Uh, which provides uh, specialized support. It also includes our remote pilot lead vehicle, uh, which uh, also known as the drone, uh, but it does significant major collision investigation. Uh, this year has been a record year in our community for road fatalities, but we also work very closely with all levels of government around uh, road safety, engineering design, a review of collisions, um, and they're highly specialized. And so these areas are highly specialized. We don't see significant change to this area other than some realignment uh, within the organization. The Community Safety and Wellbeing Division is the largest change uh, around our operational deployment. Um, it's a new division uh, led by an inspector uh, and it's focused on community well-being. And to Mayor Sean's comments, it's focused on social determinants of health. This is really focused on uh, the next three years of how do we transition as a police service from dealing with those that may not necessarily require policing services, but at four in the morning, we're the only agency that's available. So how do we downstream, upstream? How do we divert? How do we actually look at different opportunities? Um, and it's really essentially composed of uh, three major areas. One is the community resources team. The community resources team is comprised of community resource officers that are tied to the connectivity table. Uh, they're tied to well-being Waterloo region. They're tied to many different community agencies around uh, resolutions. And so, for example, uh, shelter care is one of those pieces where this team has worked very closely. Previously, it was decentralized in each of the urban areas. But one of the things uh, over the last year that we're recognizing is that the issues and the way that we provide policing services has to be a one city model. We have to look at the region very differently uh, because the, the issues transcend. And so in particular, we've seen shelter care move out of downtown Kitchener into the east end of Kitchener, now up into the city of Waterloo. So the community resource team will be tasked uh, under the leadership of uh, Deputy Hilton, uh, the staff superintendent and superintendent inspector around a couple of significant uh, strategies. One is a neighborhood and community engagement strategy. I know that the police service board hosted uh, approximately 20 town hall sessions 
uh, with community groups, neighborhood associations, <clears throat> diverse groups from across the region. I had the pleasure along with Shirley and Mark to join many of those conversations. One of the consistent message we heard from our community was, we no longer know how to connect. We're not sure where to go. We're not sure who we actually work with. The service used to have a centralized team that did this work and now it's decentralized and your people move around the region. And so we need to once again develop a neighborhood community engagement strategy, which is also very much tied to our equity inclusion and diversity strategy. We heard loud and clear that our community agencies, our community groups, our diverse neighborhoods, they want to know who to connect with. And so we've also bolstered up our equity inclusion diversity unit. Uh, it's fully staffed. Uh, we have no vacancies. Uh, the only discussion we're having is adding a fifth individual in that unit around data analysis, because naturally that's a large part of our data strategy, uh, but we now have a larger team. Uh, so they will develop for 2021, a neighborhood community engagement strategy that gets to the root issues. Why are we in this neighborhood? Why are we in this community consistently? No longer band-aid solutions, but actually long-term solutions, which will actually help reallocate, which will actually help transition the issues that we're facing. Um, that also includes a homeless housing and a shelter care strategy. We are connected to all of these different challenges in the community. Often we are actually called or we're doing proactive work. And so the work of Superintendent Goodman uh, that we recently did along with uh, uh, Constable Jim Mitchell, uh, along with Constable Tim Lane Smith around shelter care. We were in the neighborhoods with our partners explaining shelter care. Our service produced an in-kind video for the House of Friendship explaining shelter care, explaining the journey. We intersect with these individuals, these citizens who require services or come in conflict with the law. So we have to look at how we do business. And that will be also tied to a youth diversion and a restorative justice strategy. When you look at the individuals, as I said, we end up dealing with individuals who uh, are vulnerable, maybe marginalized, maybe at a difficult point in their life, where the judicial system is not the answer. In fact, a caring, compassionate community approach is the answer. It could be youth diversion, it can be adult diversion, it can be restorative justice. We can do business differently than simply processing everything through the judicial system. This will also allow us to work with well-being Waterloo Region, the connectivity tables with these strategies to look at the root causes of the challenges that we're facing, which once again will push and look at how do we provide a different approach where policing is not the primary responder. The impact team, as uh, you're aware, uh, we've had a long partnership over the last number of years with Community and Mental Health Association with mental health clinicians based in all three of our urban divisions, which provide support across the region. Our recommendation and the recommendation of our operational alignment team is to use dedicated officers to work every single day with our mental health clinicians. Our recommendation and our movement into 2021, well, these officers will also receive specific training, enhanced training around mental health intervention. So the more than 6,000 calls that we go to a year or almost 16 a day, They'll have specific training. They'll have a mental health clinician with them. They'll also wear potentially a modernized different uniform. And so we'll transition from the traditional police uniform to something that is more welcoming, which may not create the same challenges of a uniformed officer showing up. Um, and the reality is, is we'll also look at how do we triage? How do we do business differently? So how do we take the 6,000 calls that we're the primary responder to and how do we divert how do we provide a better continuity of public health and public care? So this will be tied to a three-year <clears throat> mental health triage and communication community strategy. And the goal at that end of the three years, working with all of our partners and not led by police, but led by our health community, will be how do we actually reduce the demand on policing around mental health? How do we provide better care <clears throat> for those that are in need? The last piece around this is the neighborhood policing team. <clears throat> we receive significant demand in the downtowns and the uptown. That is the reality. Um, so despite some significant economic and vitality and work that's happening amongst our municipalities, one of the largest demand on services in the region of Waterloo is in a one square kilometer block in the city of Kitchener. <clears throat> and it's bound from Victoria to Cedar from Weber to Charles. 
and we have significant demand on policing. This strategy will be a region-wide strategy. It will enhance visibility in all the downtowns and all the up and one uptown, um, but it will allow us to actually move through the region, not and mobilize our resources very differently so that we're not tied to one urban area. We will go where the challenges take us. Recently this summer, we as an organization tried to pivot and move resources to deal with significant issues in downtown Galt. It was problematic. Realigning our operations, this will allow us to take a one city region wide approach where we move resources based on where the demand is and based on where the challenges are. So it doesn't matter. It's not static deployment. It's not consistent deployment. What it is is actually allows us to deal with the issues and challenges we face as an organization. This well-being division will link with Waterloo Wellbeing, our connectivity tables, the, whatever the future of those pieces are. And it will also work with the Police Services Board to develop our well-being strategy. This is about call diversion. It's about reducing the demand on policing, but more importantly, it's about addressing the root causes. It also requires all systems to work together. We need a table where our provincial leaders are at, where our federal leaders are at, and where our regional leaders are at. It requires leadership. And we do this at different places and we work very closely with some agencies, but we need a much more system-wide approach. This is about investment in community. And so the other piece to this is around accountability. We need more from our membership. We need more from our leadership. And so neighborhood policing mid leaders will be assigned to specific neighborhoods, community associations, stakeholder partner agencies, and municipal councillors. And so I'll use the example of Sergeant Kelly Preble in rural. And I know Mayor Schantz is on the line here. Everybody in rural Waterloo region knows who Kelly is. She's connected, she's dealing with issues, she's managing the root causes, she's diverting demand on policing. We have to translate and replicate that across the region. And we need to do better. We heard that from our community. We heard that from our citizens and we need to do more work in our urban areas. This also includes the full implementation of equity, inclusion and diversity strategy. There's a significant five pillar approach the number one pillar is authentic engagement on authentic inclusion. We've heard that loud and clear. We have a team put together now working on a 2021 plan. It also will include a multifaceted strategy over the next three years. All levels of government, all partners. We need to build a system-wide capacity. We need to triage police calls for service very differently. We need to look at diversion, restorative justice, and a focus on enhanced upstream prevention and something that I call the 30 plus initiative. And it's investing in the call for service. Many of our challenges, many of the roots of the disconnect with those that we come in contact with is our members are busy. There's a demand, they're well-intended. They're managing more than 800 calls a day. So if I can frame it, when they start their shift and they get in the cruiser and they log in, they're looking at a screen that is filled with demand for service. And of course that, you know, natural inherent level of service is okay. I got to clear this call. I got to move to the next call. We need to take a pause. We need to invest in the citizen that is calling for our help and we need to solve the issue. And so the plan is 30 plus. The goal is to spend 30 minutes at each service call extra to get it right to solve the issue, to divert the issue, to refer the issue to the right area. Many of the challenges we face are not policing issues, but we get called. So how do we actually divert? How do we actually refer? And how do we do a better job of that? And we'll be rolling that out through neighborhood policing. Of course, the investigative services division, as you heard, a lot of the crime and the significant crime is investigated by these skilled individuals. We have just over 166 investigators assigned to this area, currently led by Superintendent Fenton and Inspector Deb McBride and Inspector Brenna Bond. These are talented investigators with specialized skill sets. They range from detectives to covert operators, to cybercrime experts, to financial crime experts. Um, and this is a significant part. If we get it really good at the front line, when our investigative team arrives at the scene, 
the package is ready for them to take the next step. And so it's very important that this is an integrated strategy. A couple of the key overview, I won't get into all the deals, but all the, the intricacies of the operations, but we need to pivot. Our business is changing. As I alluded to on November 12th at 525 in the AM, the 911 call, multiple calls for shots fired on Westwood Drive. This is new to our community. So our investigative capacity is not necessarily aligned expecting that. A year ago on Easter long weekend, 35 shots fired into a business in Uptown Waterloo. This is new to our community. Uh, I think as Margaret explained, firearm offenses and violations is our biggest growth area. So we're implementing the four platoon model with thanks to the, the police association and our uh, relationship is that they're advancing and working with us to pivot the Police Labor Association working with us to pivot to answer the need of our community. A four platoon 12 hour shift model for enhanced community and frontline support. That will impact our intimate partner violence unit, our general investigation unit, our special victims unit. And so we'll provide service beyond our current hours. In fact, into the morning hours, uh, into 2, 2 a.m. in the morning, where currently we're not providing that service past 11.30 a.m. These are major crime complex investigations the implementation of the duty sergeant office that will manage the investigative capacity of our organization, coordinate all the major investigations, enhanced investigative leadership, enhanced support for our investigative, uh, for our complainants, our victim survivor, and our advocacy for agent and partner uh, referral. And I'll highlight the recent partnership with Woman Crisis of Waterloo Region, where they're doing safeguard planning with our intimate partner, partner violence unit. This is just one example of doing business differently. Our investigators come and go. They work long hours. When they're called to a major crime and a homicide, their hours are generally 18 to 20 hours a day in the first series of the volume of the investigation because the first 72 hours are critical. It's not healthy for our members. We need duty sergeants that are coordinating our staffing, ensuring the wellness of our members while ensuring the continuity of the investigation. This will be key. Enhanced property and financial crime team. As I alluded to, we have a break and enter and vehicle theft team that does amazing work. They are coordinated, intelligence led. I often refer to them as the rock stars of our organization. They bring support to victims of crime where they've been violated. Their house has been broken into. Their business has been broken into. Those are really challenging issues for our community but we're going to add the creation of a robbery team and also a organized financial crime team or financial crime has changed. We've gone from investigating, you know, false pretenses, bounce checks to sophisticated identity theft, credit card theft, identity theft, which is often linked to organized crime. We'll also be implementing a shooting investigation framework, which every shooting that we have will build a cross-functional framework that builds investigative teams to address gun violence in our region. And we've already seen that. In fact, the Superintendent Fenton has been piloting this and we see a very quick turnaround in an arrest in the most recent shooting. Our administrative and member services is led by Deputy Chief Crowell. This area is largely civilian professionals. Um, they provide significant lifelines within our organization. Of course, many of you get to see uh, these talented senior leaders, uh, but there's a whole cadre of amazing people behind the scene. Um, one of the big areas of change uh, is uh, within a couple of different areas. One is in our human resource branch. We, under the, under the uh, former direction of Ms. Penny Smiley, who set the framework in the succession plan for Ms. Kimple uh, to bring her energy, to bring her vibrancy to our organization, We've enhanced our employee relations. We've added organizational development and culture. And one of the pieces that we wanna add is labor relations. We deal with significant complex issues in policing and there's work to be done around that. There's minimal change uh, in our finance and assets branch. Uh, as you know, Ms. Kirsten Hand over the last four years has revolutionized the way that we provide financial reporting, accountability and manage our assets. And uh, her team remains the same. We have a director of administrative support branch, Ms. Kate Richardson, 
Uh, what we'll be doing is rolling court services under that area because there's a natural link of digital evidence management and all of the different work we're doing around evidence, uh, uh, um, electronic court reporting, et cetera. And one of the pieces that we're committed to doing in 2021 is reviewing our whole court service operation. Do we need the investment? Is it changing? Can we do business differently? Can we work with the attorney general very differently? Our director of information technology, Ms. Mr. Bob Hillhorst, will take on voice radio, which will move from the operational side of the house uh, because it's a significant technology. And thanks to the investment of the police services board in the region of Waterloo, we have a state-of-the-art communication system now uh, that ensures the safety of our members and our community. A new addition is a superintendent, and it's not a new staffing, but it's a reallotment of existing resources and a repurposing that will oversee our professional standards branch and our training and education branch. We're well served by those members in our professional standards branch around internal uh, investigations, SIU liaison. Our training and education branch has a significant rollout of a leadership program, uh, new training, uh, practical skills training, and the superintendent will coordinate that, but we'll also coordinate a special project, which is respect in the workplace. There'll be a new project implemented. We've done significant work around workplace culture. We've done significant review of our workplace harassment, our respect in the workplace, but there's still work to be done in our culture. There's still work to be done in policing to ensure a safe workplace. And that senior leader will take on that and ensure that we meet not only uh, the past challenges, but we build a safer future. And so a couple of the key pieces, as I alluded to, um, that will happen uh, as we head into 2021 is the labor relations manager uh, to manage uh, and actually reduce long-term labor issues and labor grievances and costly arbitration matters. The respect in the workplace portfolio, which is key to the safety of our members and builds on all of our equity, inclusion, and diversity work a diversity recruitment strategy uh, that will be rolled out as a part of our EID plan, the wellness 2.0 strategy, which will include a suicide prevention strategy for internally, as we know that it's a significant issue in policing, as well as we know that the pandemic will roll into 2021 and will include a pandemic wellness strategy. The staffing and financial impact, there's no new staffing request. This is internal reallocation. It's repurposing of existing authorized human resources. It does come with a financial impact of 65.5 K uh, and that deals with collective bargaining. It deals with uh, variation of, uh, of uh, job evaluation, uh, realignment, uh, the accrual of the 12 hour shift. And this has actually been built into our 2021 proposed uh, budget. So, but there's no staffing requests. We're pivoting our organization with our existing resources, uh, despite staffing plans that tell us, you know, in an ideal world, in a world that isn't filled uh, with discussion around what policing looks like, and in a world that isn't filled with financial challenges for municipal uh, uh, communities, um, there is, a, you know, a call to add staffing, but we're not doing that. This is all internally led with repurposing and reallocation. At the heart of this, the business that we're in, the profession we're in is people focused, both internally and externally. And it's driven by our people. They're our greatest asset. And so on this chart, you see the future of our service. Constable uh, Chelsea Jeffrey, who works in the North Division. Constable Blaise Mowat, who works in the Central Division. New members in our organization, uh, strong academic rigor, uh, they're the face of the future of our organization. They're people focused and they're people driven. So again, this is the operational alignment. Uh, the next steps as we roll through this, uh, this is very operationally oriented, but there is a, uh, an organizational structure that, uh, that changes slightly uh, that will come to the board in December for final approval and recommendation because the board is responsible for the structure of the organization, but these are the operational pieces that driven. Um, I'll just turn to uh, Deputy Crowell and Deputy Hilton if I've missed anything or they wish to add anything to my comments and then please to take your questions. Deputy Crowell, do you have any comments? I don't. Um, the Chief captured the good uh, portion of the admin and member services uh, uh, slide there. I'll turn over to uh, Deputy Hilton who has the majority of the operational areas. Thank you. Deputy Hilton, do you have any comments? 
You know, the only thing I'll add is that um, the flexibility in terms of uh, being responsive to um, not only the crime in our community, but certainly what the uh, community is expecting from us. And so this, this uh, realignment um, is definitely reflective of this and has to be an assessment that's done um, more often so that we can remain nimble. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Carl, go ahead. Do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks, Chief and Deputies, for that presentation. Uh, uh, I'm excited about the fact that uh, we're, we would go to this type of realignment. I think it'll be tremendous for the community. Um, I wanted to bring to everybody's attention that uh, Rosita and I had the opportunity to see a, uh, a documentary film, I think, based from the San Antonio, Texas Police Department. I'm sure others may have seen it as well, but it deals with uh, a couple of officers that they uh, sent out on uh, mental health calls along with a, 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 um, a psychologist, I believe, or, or a social worker. And uh, these officers are plain clothes. And I think the chief alluded to the fact that uh, uh, in his plan, the, the officers would be not uh, in uniform, which I think can uh, help sometimes on these mental health calls. But it was an exciting documentary to see. And uh, it really embraced the, the community and the community embraced it. So I'm excited to, for the fact that this particular plan, which is a little different and a little more comprehensive in my mind, uh, will uh, help us immensely. So congratulations to the chief and his team for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Ian, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Redmond. Um, Chief, I, I, I guess just in context, we, we've had a lot of calls for defunding the police. It seems to me, and, and I think this board is, is looking at, at how we um, address the, the changing needs in the, in the community, mental health and others, which you've highlighted. Um, when you talk about diverting calls for service so, so that they're better positioned, that's, that's, well, that seems to me that that's the, that's the first step along the way of saying, right now, when anyone calls with a, with, with a challenge, it could be mental health, could be anything else, it comes to the police service. So until we have something else, that's where the calls go, but this is this this uh, this approach is meant to try and get those calls better positioned so that it's people out, uh, the better outcomes for people. Um, so I, I guess I just want you to is is this the first step along uh, uh, the road that uh, that we have to travel to get to that that you know that that point it, where where I think the public wants us to be, which is police focused on policing and other organizations to support um, the the other issues which the community faces. Chief? Thanks, Mr. McLean. And that's exactly uh, what we're laying out here is a, is a general three-year strategy. Uh, we need to pivot our investigative services to deal with the crime in our community. We have crime. That's the reality. Um, the other reality is we have over 800 calls for service a day that we need to respond to right now. We, the other piece of this is we need to ensure that we provide adequate and effective police services under the legislation. Um, and that's my responsibility to ensure that I provide that to the board, to the community. It's very operationally based. Um, and the fourth piece of this is a culture piece. Uh, we need to change our culture and we need to continue to work on um, an equity and inclusion and diversity and a series of strategies in a respectful workplace. But you can see very heavily in the community well-being branch um, community safety and well-being branch. This is about long-term strategies about diverting call demand from policing to other areas. I firmly believe that you can't simply turn the tap off. I firmly believe that we can't simply say at effective January 1st, we're no longer going at three in the morning to this call for service. Because the reality is, is there's nobody else at three in the morning providing service. Uh, we are it. Um, so, but I do believe that we can make the taps slowly blend, that we can go from hot and cold to lukewarm, uh, where we provide capacity to other agencies. We're doing that with shelter care. We know that shelter care will reduce demand on policing. We've seen it. We're working with the House of Friendship. We're working with the Working Center. We also know with shelter care that there will be bubbles around the shelter that create some trepidation in the community that require police support and police intervention, but we can transition to other mechanisms. We've seen it with the consumption treatment site. You know, we've actually seen that there's not necessarily significant challenges around consumption treatment sites if we do it well and we do it well planned. And 
Mental health calls for service. Our goal is, is to offload the 6,000 calls. And when I say offload, it's not just simply, it's about better health care. Um, and of course, the underlying current of this, um, which is I'm very passionate about and currently advocating at a national level, is let's treat addiction as a health issue. Let's not criminalize addiction. Let's take a different approach, which if we can solve addiction and we can solve these pieces, we'll reduce call demand on policing. It will then allow us to focus on that earlier portion in the call in the board meeting I talked about, which is those people that prey on the marginalized and vulnerable. There are people that are criminals and there are people that need police intervention and need the judicial system. I would say that that's a small percentage of society that requires police intervention and a large portion of society that requires care. Um, but we're not gonna do this overnight. It's gonna, you know, I have a three year strategy uh, and the reality is, is the strategy will likely outlive my tenure as the chief. Uh, and the next generation of police leaders will take that on uh, and do a better job with our community leaders. Many of these initiatives, uh, Mr. McLean, will not be police led. We'll set the table, but it will be led by others. Um, and that's my commitment to the police services board. Uh, so Deputy Hilton and Deputy Crowell have a tall task. Uh, we have a series of strategies that we're outlining here today that through 2021 will formulate in partnership with the strategic plan of the board. We've heard this, we need to pivot. Uh, we've heard this over the last 90 days. We've heard this over the last six months. We've seen crime over the last five years escalate in our community. We need to pivot now and hence the operational alignment. But the long-term goal is to reduce demand. That's our goal. So uh, I appreciate that that comment because I, I think one of the, the issues I think we face as a board is I think you're on the same page, we're on the same page in terms of that pivot point, you're, the plan recognizes that. I think there's a there's the perception that there's a cognitive dissonance, right? That that because it's not changing all in one moment, that that we're not getting it. And I and I, it's it's refri I mean, it's helpful to hear how the operational plan is going to connect with the strategic plan and get to that point where we are diverting more of the resources needed for other community aspects. Uh, but policing is still one of those ones that. Everyone expects the police to turn up when there's a traffic accident or a, um, a violent crime, uh, and I and I appreciate the you know that all of those pieces have to fit together. And I sometimes don't think people understand how complex the the uh, the equation is. So thanks for that, Chief. Tony, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I, I agree with Ian. You know, this is very complex. And uh, I, I want to just uh, thank uh, yourself, Chief, and the deputies and your team. Uh, I think it's a great presentation. Uh, I like where this is going and, and, and how, it's, how it kind of started. And uh, the one question I have is, and, and one of my thoughts is, um, you know, this is a three-year-plus type process, right, uh, evolution. And it's easy to forget uh, how I looked like three years ago. And do I look any different today than I did three years ago? So part of in my mentality in organization is having some key metrics, KPIs, you know, indicators, some of them may be soft, whatever. Have you and the team thought about, and I know this is a high level presentation, have you thought about some of those key performance indicator or metrics that you can look at over the period of time to say, wow, look what we're doing. We're, you know, it's not the big jump, but we're making progress in all of these facets. Um, I know it hasn't been presented here, but I was just, I, I think part of it uh, is uh, for the community as well, as well as for the board to kind of see that progress that's being made with these strategies over time, right? And it may be incremental, but that's okay. It's progress. So have you thought about some of those uh, KPIs or as I call them, but it may be too broad of a term. Chief? Well, oh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, the key performance indicators are key. Um, and so the operational realignment, I can tell you that investigative services is ready to go live January 3rd. Uh, Superintendent Fenton and his team are ready. Uh, the membership, the mid leaders are ready. We have some uh, transitional pieces, but Deputy Hilton has assured me that January 3rd, they're ready to pivot. Um, and it's much easier in, the, in our crime piece, our investigations to create the KPIs. Uh, so, because some of those are nationally led through uniform crime reporting, clearance rates, um, solvency rates, time on investigation, task on investigation. Some of the more challenging ones are at the neighborhood perspective. Um, and so our goal is on the neighborhood policing realignment, because we do need to do some 
uh, outreach uh, with our municipal uh, leaders around some of the changes that they'll see and witness um, is that our goal is is over the next 90 days to develop those uh, to develop the team uh, so there is an actual uh, an advancement a superintendent will uh, take on and, and uh, be promoted to staff superintendent and there'll be a new team uh, pulled together and we're working very closely with the team who's been a part of this uh, they'll be responsible for working with deputy hilton on some of the kpis and we'll report back to the board on those as we roll through we anticipate likely uh, march to roll out the new neighborhood policing plan by the time we get all of our kpis together uh, we do a current snapshot of how we look now um, i know i look very differently than six years ago when i was sworn in as the chief um, and um, and so yes we're working through all of those things you posted on Deputy Crowell's uh, perspective, much of the one of the key projects will be in courts and evidence management, body worn video. The other key piece for Deputy Crowell is around the respect in the workplace portfolio, where we do plan to create KPIs around uh, public reporting of internal workplace complaints, et cetera. So stay tuned on that. We'll keep the board updated as we transition into our new alignment. Thank you. Karen, please go ahead. Thanks, and I think this presentation is actually really nicely positioned between the last presentation related to um, national policing statistics and our next conversation, which is about the budget. Because um, when I read this, it I was really delighted by it. Just honestly, because when you think most organizations, when you think of organizations that are facing you know volume increases, we saw in that last presentation, we see increases in in violent crime and there's just the acuity is going up and the you know the cooperation all good things but it it means that often organizations are stuck in how do i fight the fire that's going on right now and so to see that your organization the police service is thinking at the senior leadership level of how do we transform at the same time as that is actually impressive to me that we're seeing that as part of a plan um, you know, I echo what Tony was talking about. I think, you know, I'm a strategist, right? So I can come up with a million strategies, super easy, where it's really hard is in the change management and implementation piece of it. So I agree with Tony um, that having sort of those key metrics that are, you know, incremental wins as part of this. I liked how you've already done so much consultation with the membership related to what this is going to look like because people just get worried. How is this going to change my job and my responsibilities and reporting? And it's not that they're necessarily opposed to the change. It's that they worry about how that's going to impact what their daily lives and responsibility is. So I was pleased to see that outreach. So this is just a comment to say, uh, I commend the service for during a time of you know, a lot of upheaval right now, both you know socially and in terms of COVID and all of the things that the organization is already dealing with. I was very pleased to see such a forward thinking, how do we shift our organization and move it to the next step, building on what sort of Ian was talking about in terms of where we are going as a service. I thought it was great. Thank you. I don't see any more speakers. I guess just to add my voice, I think this is very impressive, Chief. And the demands that we've heard of and um, the suggestions of looking at things differently, even from our delegation today, Mr. Uh, Nabi, I think this proves that it isn't just checking a box off, that this really is fundamentally changing in order to make sure that meaningful change is coming to not only the service, but how we um, support the community so the people are safe and feel safe. So um, I think this is a real demonstration that um, police services have been listening and uh, would really um, add my support for the KPIs. And I'm sure you're far further down that road than, than I've even thought about, but I think the challenge is how do you get this message out to the broader community? This is a public meeting, it's live streamed. These are exciting changes. We've got a date that they're starting January the 3rd. Um, all of this is really good news and very positive and we will track it as time goes by. Um, one of the challenges, how do we get the community to know that these changes are happening? Thanks, Chair Redmond and all members of the board for your continued support. Um, these are interesting times. Um, um, and so the communication piece is one of the challenges that we face, particularly in the pandemic. Um, and so we are working uh, with our corporate communications team to roll this out much broader. Uh, as I alluded to, we also be reaching out to our municipal partners 
um, because we do think that this will enhance policing in their community, will enhance connectivity to the our to their police service and to our members. Um, so stay tuned. I think in December, as we come back for the official approval of the org chart, uh, which is really a process-driven piece, but we definitely have a uh, concept around uh, communication strategies, enhanced strategies as we roll this out. As I said, the investigative piece is somewhat easier than the neighborhood policing piece. So stay tuned uh, as we roll out in December as well. Thank you. Very exciting. Um, that, this was for information. It was a verbal update. And again, um, I think we all look forward to um, seeing this uh, unfold and implement. The next agenda item um, is actually um, looking for some direction to the chief and staff. And this has to do with the 2021 budget. So chief, are you back up? Thanks so much, Chair Redman. Members of the board, um, uh, you know, always a challenging way to end a, a long meeting is on budget. Um, but I think to, uh, to Ms. Schnarr's comments, so we wanted to provide context. Um, you know, I recognize that these are challenging times in our community, in our province, our nation, financially. Um, you know, we're blessed as an organization that we've been able to mitigate uh, and have cost avoidance and strategies. Um, this is the second iteration. I'm joined, uh, obviously, by the deputies, but we have Ms. Kirsten Hand, um, our amazing Director of Finance and Assets. Uh, as well as Ms. Uh, Susan Wilson, who's the manager of finance that provides uh, significant leadership and support to Kirsten. Um, this is a second iteration. At the last meeting, the board did ask us to return with a variation of scenarios. You asked for two to three. We've over-delivered with six. Uh, felt it was important to have a larger conversation and strategy. So we are looking for a conversation dialogue direction. Um, we recognize that we'll be back in December uh, the 16th. Um, but I will turn it over to Ms. Kirsten Hand to take you through the budget presentation, um, all the complexities of the scenarios that are presented, and then uh, myself and the deputies, along with Kirsten and Susan, are available to answer any questions you may have. Uh, but I do want to reemphasize, we put a lot of effort into this. We've heard loud and clear the challenges we're facing. Uh, and I want to also be clear, this is not an expansion budget. Um, this is an actual budget to maintain adequate and effective policing um, as we roll through. So over to you, Kirsten, and uh, thanks to you and Susan and your team uh, for amazing work to date. Thank Welcome, you. Kirsten. I'm just going to share my Perfect. All right. I think I'm set up. Does it look okay? It looks great. All right, so just to take you through um, the activities since the last time we spoke, um, on October 14th, we did provide a preliminary budget position to the board. At that point, there was direction um, for us to come back with two to three scenarios and how they may impact service levels and operations, as well as provide an overview of continuous improvement efficiencies to date. Um, as the chief mentioned, uh, we did overachieve and provided uh, six scenarios, which we'll take you through in a couple moments. Um, an update from October was that we were notified from the region that assessment growth was unfortunately reduced from 1.5% to 1.4%. And what that means is um, it's about a $180,000 impact. So in terms of looking at net tax rate impact scenarios, that meant that we had to find an additional $180,000 of reductions, essentially as a step off point from October um, as a result of that growth reducing. Uh, we have continued to review our estimates uh, through the budget process, and we have come up with about $300,000 of reductions from that starting point that we took you through in October. Um, and just as a quick aside, there was discussion at the October meeting around cost recovery opportunities. And we did, um, while I won't go through them in detail in this presentation, there is, they are listed in the report. Um, and some of them being um, situations where we provide services or support to areas outside of the police service, including bylaw dispatch uh, communication center um, for uh, 911, which includes paramedics, fire and police uh, for the region, enforcement of cannabis legislation, support to the regional well-being uh, program, 
support for funding of supplies for the POA ticket process, as well as uh, financial support towards the Children's Safety Village. Some of the reductions since October include um, the region did notify us that they were going to reduce the rent charges um, for the buildings that we occupy. A couple of reasons for that, they went through a procurement process that resulted in some reductions and some costs assumed uh, within the rent charges. So right now we're at about $2.5 million that we would pay annually um, in relation to rent to the region to occupy the facilities. The other piece relates to software maintenance. We were able to reduce that partly due to the upgrade of the administrative phone system. And we had previously communicated some expense reductions we expected um, moving forward with that project, as well as we, were, we are deferring or pausing on any enhancements to some of our systems that are tied to a future replacement of a human resource information system project. Um, and then we are also looked at some volunteer programs in light of the pandemic. It's expected that they won't resume activity for the majority of 2021. So we reduced some of their expenditures associated with those volunteer programs. We looked at where it might be possible to procure small equipment or uniform in 2020 as opposed to 2021 budget. And we were able to move forward with those. Again, the pausing of a school-based program uh, resulted in reductions of savings uh, budget next year of 10k and lastly we had a couple procurement processes one of them being the director of psychological services that we spoke to today that resulted in some savings to the budget so our starting point that i'll take you through today in terms of our scenarios is 188.9 million dollars or a 4.8 percent increase year over year Again, in the package, we did provide, try to provide some context in terms of how we compare to other services um, to date um, in terms of their budget process, as well as how we compare to police services across the country. So this is a very busy slide, I apologize, but it does provide six various scenarios. And if I just focus on one of them, for a second to take you through uh, the math a little bit. So what we looked at is the direction from regional council to regional staff was to look at budgets of a 0% net tax rate impact with scenarios based upon inflation. So that essentially means that uh, our, from our 2020 budget, um, the assessment growth is 1.4%. So in that first scenario where inflation is 0%, we would be able to increase the budget by 1.4% and not have an impact on the um, net tax rate impact. So essentially, as you look at um, scenarios where inflation increases, that essentially is added to your assessment growth for your overall budget percentage increase year over year. So that is why um, that assessment growth, whether it goes up or goes down, does impact the overall impact um, to our community. So in the regional report, they did provide a number of projections in 2021 as for inflation, and they quite ranged from about 1% up to almost 3%. So we've provided those various scenarios um, for you in the package today being inflation at 1%, 1.5, 2, 2.5, and 3. And for some of the factors, I'll just take you through some of the assumptions we looked at. We looked at where we could, uh, staff would be comfortable with recommending some budget decreases. And beyond that, then we unfortunately needed to go to either reduction of staff or service levels. So in the chart, it shows you with the various scenarios um, what that number would be and approximately how many FTEs or police officers that would need that would equate to. As well, we took a look at our salary gap and vacancy rate. We currently have a, uh, we've assumed about 10 FTE vacancies throughout the year, but we looked where we could potentially increase that based upon where we're at today and where we expect to be with recruitment. Of course, our, our goal is that we can fill these positions because they do not filling them have impact both on our, our ability to clear um, crime, but as well on um, items such as overtime and wellness. So we were comfortable with increasing the salary gap vacancy rate 
up to a maximum of um, $1 million, which would mean that we would have to ensure that an additional seven positions remain vacant throughout the year. We also looked at our sick leave gratuity. So this is an item that has been grandparented out of our collective agreements, but members that were hired before August 2005, when they retire, resign, um, they are eligible for their personal sick leave balance to be paid out at 50% or a maximum of six months. So as Melly referred to earlier, we have a number of um, higher than um, previous years retirements, which is impacting that number. So both in 2020 and next year, we expect to be above budget. So we looked at our uh, benefit stabilization reserve and we felt that we would be able to pull money from that reserve to essentially um, mitigate um, that impact in 2021, because we do expect the numbers to um, fall off in, in or reduce, sorry, in 2022. Uh, the next item benefits is, as I mentioned um, last month, we saw a number of increases in benefits, both CPP enhanced program, medical and dental increases, um, uh, the annualization of our long-term disability program and increases in retiree benefit costs. Um, so in the 2020 budget, we did assume about a $715,000 um, transfer from the benefit stabilization reserve to help phase that in. And we're proposing that we could see a further um, transfer from the reserve about a $500,000 to continue to phase in these increases. We took a look at our fuel estimates and based upon a reduction of expected rates next year, we were comfortable with reducing our fuel estimate. We issued a request for proposal more recently to look at alternative service delivery for our court screening processes, which would um, look at potential savings next year of 115,000. Uh, we have spoken with the region and in our 2020 budget, we did see increased PPE supply requirements as a result of continuization of the pandemic. Um, and they were able to share with us some funding to offset that impact on our budget next year of 86,000. We re-looked at our accrued time payout estimate and this is for our people in a 12 hour shift um, because on average, they will end up working more hours than a person on a regular day shift. We provide them with a bank of time that would make them essentially whole or equal, neutral to people on day shifts. Um, so we really looked at how much they can get up to 20 hours a year paid out, but we really looked at those numbers and were able to reduce them by about 20, sorry, 50. And then the last one was tuition, where we looked at our tuition reimbursement program and we had initially assumed that we would increase that by 20,000 but um, we have looked at just keeping that essentially flat year over year. So that totals um, various reductions uh, in the different scenarios and I just wanted to lastly bring it to the board's attention that um, some of these items are um, they will have an impact on 2022 budget in terms of annualization impacts. So I also noted that impact both in terms of dollars and percentage of budget year over year. Also included in the report, as we mentioned before, the service is very focused on continuous improvement and efficiencies. And we pulled together all projects, whether completed or work in progress of the last five years, we work very closely um, with the strategic services group who, who manage um, the coordination of all the projects. And, and they were able to provide to us a comprehensive list of 47 projects um, listed in the report that have been able to allow us to uh, continue to improve the way that we provide services as well as be efficient and effective uh, within them as well. So just lastly, um, just a recap of the timeline. So on December 16th, we will present to the board for final approval. That afternoon, uh, we are on the schedule with regional council to present with regional council approval in January. Thank you. So that concludes my presentation. If anyone has any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsten. Uh, Ian, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Redmond. Um, I just want to be clear because sometimes regional finance uh, doesn't make sense. In any event, that's just me, since I 
I wanted to get the clear. The 1.4 percent that's a the that is along the bottom at the zero percent inflation. That's the regional assessment growth that would come for to account for the growth in the region as a whole. So that's that's the region that 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 comes just because of the regional growth. That and, and that that accounts for the increase, at least in some measure, the the uh, enhanced service levels to account for population. Have I got that about right? Exactly. Okay. Wow. I, I, seven years on council, I finally got that right. Well, that's good. Um, so maybe this is more for the chief. Um, as I look at the the scenarios three and four, um, obviously five and six, we've we've you know nipped and tucked, uh, and or four, five, and six. And if you, when you get into scenario three, you're really looking at it. Look, I think it's not on this um, the one that we have here at home, but on that screen, it accounted for about seven or eight staff positions. Um, so, I guess the the question I have is if we went for uh, scenario three, which is 2.9% increase versus scenario four versus 3.4. Um, what's the impact on service and or the, the staffing levels? What's the impact on the organization and delivery of service? I, I, I mean, that's, that's ultimately where my head's at right now. Thanks for uh, Mr. McLean. And so um, as you alluded to through scenario one through four, uh, there is a reduction and a requirement to reduce staffing. Um, it varies between obviously one, which is extensive uh, in the range of 27 FTEs uh, to scenario four, uh, which is one FTE. Um, so I th the screen is coming up now uh, for everybody to see exactly what I'm speaking to. So you can see the variation of the, stra of the different pieces. So you have to also include in that though, is that we've actually as an organization, um, there's some natural sal salary gapping. So particularly uh, from, you know, we have a retirement and the Ontario Police College runs uh, three or four intakes a year. And so there is some natural salary gapping uh, where there is general uh, naturalized vacancies. And so you can see uh, that uh, uh, our CFO, Ms. Hand and her team is recommending that we increase our salary gapping vacancy to a million dollars, which is about uh, plus seven full-time equivalents. So you have to, I look at it from a broader perspective. So if you go to scenario three, you reduce uh, by 15 FTEs. And I like to put things in context. So the reduction of 15 FTEs is our current uh, road safety unit. Um, we would actually, you know, and I'm not saying we would collapse that, but it gives you some context of the impact. Um, that it would impact our, uh, if you looked at neighborhood policing operations, it would impact uh, right across our organization, each patrol unit, would lose one officer uh, to give you context because you have the salary gapping and then you have the FTE level. And now we would generally look at how do we broaden those out across the service. Um, so naturally, you know, in any scenario from one to four, there is a demand, uh, but I wanna, you know, um, when you look at our, we're pivoting with no additional requests for staffing. We're pivoting our organization. Last year, we repurposed 16 positions without asking the board and or regional council for more money. Um, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of that because it's our leadership team that actually came together and said, listen, we understand there's pressure. Let's do business different. Let's repurpose. Let's reallocate internally. Um, but we've been doing that uh, other than two years ago where we added 47 frontline members. We really have not added staffing and our community grows. When you come through downtown Kitchener, there's 12 cranes in the sky. Our universities are growing and expanding. Our college is growing and expanding. Uh, along Maple Grove Road, our industrial boxwood industrial section is growing. There's housing units going in not far from police headquarters. Um, on Northfield Drive, there's housing units being developed. In Elmira, there's uh, neighborhoods being added. In Baden, there's neighborhoods being added. In Breslau, there's massive development. We're seeing growth across the region and, and whether, you know, um, there, there'll be people that say, uh, well, you know, the police don't need to go. Those neighborhoods drive, generate calls for service and demand. And so in the last couple of years, we've not, you know, for fiscal reasons and to be a larger corporate partner, we've actually deferred any hiring of new FTEs. We've done work internally, uh, the frontline support unit, obviously our strategy is looking at how do we do business differently. Uh, but at some point, you know, like the 1.4% 
growth assessment is about actually adding. Uh, and so, you know, I, and I appreciate that people are, are concerned about the $8 million originally, it's less now, uh, you know, the 6 million year over year change. Uh, this isn't an expansion budget. $6 million would keep our service as is today. It would pay for CPP, WSIB, uh, increases in rent, increases in hydro, increase in water usage, um, you know, all those processes. So we're not, so I think, you know, to your point, Mr. McLean, is anything, you know, quite frankly, that, that goes below where we're at today will be some form of regression. Whether it's, uh, if you look at our communication center, it's not grown. Uh, the infographic in your report today will show significant staffing gaps where we're not meeting the national standard to answer 911 calls. That is because of staffing and demand. Um, now, Superintendent Bursey and team are working on that strategy and, and not asking for more staff, looking at doing business differently. That, we've done 47 continuous improvement projects. I'm not yeah. sure where else is the chief I can squeeze the lemon. Uh, I'm doing the best I can, but at some point we have to recognize that we need to be adequately funded. So we're comfortable, like obviously uh, I'll, I'll be you know clear, scenario four for us is the most comfortable scenario. Uh, we recognize that six and five creates pressures on, on the region, creates pressures elsewhere. Um, but when you start moving into three, two, and one, uh, I have concerns as the chief to provide adequate service. So well, just one follow-up question to that, because I, I think it's important for people to get this. Um, in scenario four, which is a 3.4% increase, uh, between maintaining the level of service, the service levels, and the contractual obligations, because then we can have a discussion around the other things that are driving this, which are your contractual obligations uh, because of arbitrated settlements. There, there's basically, you've, you've cut in scenarios uh, from six and five, basically what's left with, with, and once we get past four, we're talking about bodies. And so we're talking about calls for service. We're talking about, um, you know, the things that people are expect us to be doing. And that's one of the challenges we have until we, continue to move into that new scenario where we are diverting to other agencies uh, some of the calls for service um, o over time. I, I just want to be clear on this because, you know, when we, when we, when we address this, um, it, there's, no, there's no magic pot of money that's, that's sitting. It's the same in municipalities when I was there. Um, you know, you get to a certain point and then you're, then you're talking about people and you're talking about programs. That, is that fair? That's fair. And, and generally speaking, you know, I talk about being people driven and people focused. I mean, we provide a, the, the complexity of issues that we deal with is, is solved by people. Um, but, you know, I also want to turn the board to the lens of the, in the consent agenda, uh, the interim report done by Marg and, and her team in partnership with uh, Ms. Eagleton from the board. We surveyed, uh, you know, uh, we've obviously been heavily into the strategic business plan you know, the public was asked actually to think about the number of police that they see in their neighborhood um, and indicate whether there's too many, uh, uh, about enough or too few. Um, and over a thousand responses uh, through this uh, piece, 55% felt there was too few police officers in their neighborhood, 37.4% felt that there was enough, and 5.9% thought there was too many. Um, and so when I look at this, you know, and I recognize this is a polarizing discussion, um, and there is a call to obviously um, fund policing, uh, which I believe that this, you just can't simply do that. It's irresponsible. Um, I have responsibilities as the chief to community safety, but I fundamentally agree that we can do business differently. And we've laid out a plan actually, as how we're going to advance and triage calls differently and do business differently. Uh, but in the interim, I'm also dealing with organized crime. I'm dealing with gangs. I'm dealing with increased firearm violations. Um, and I need people to respond to that. And so it's something's got to give in the system. Um, you know, and this is where we look at is it through cost recovery, uh, which again, I believe is moving shells, but, but I'm, I'll take direction from the board on that. Um, but I just caution that there's also an element and a voice in the community that calls us for more. The city of Cambridge calls us every day for more. The city of Kitchener is calling us for more. And now in Uptown Waterloo with shelter care, we're being asked for more resources to manage the complexity of some of the social rollout. Um, you know, we're dealing with the overflow at St. Mark's uh, and we have a, a public health institution calling the police every day for more support. So we have to balance the demand. We're up for the challenge. 
Um, but I caution, uh, you know, obviously, as the chief, I'm just worried about if we start actually regressing um, and cutting into staffing, um, I don't think is the answer right now. Um, and if you look at our continuous improvements and all the different pieces we've done, our leadership team has proven that they can pivot and align. Um, so that's my, my element of caution on this. Thank you, Eden. Those are your questions. Rosita, you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a question about, I, I think, to the finance team to uh, bring up, you know, different scenarios for us to review. Uh, I noticed that we've been using the uh, uh, benefits reserve, at, like we reduced the contribution to it, that's my understanding. Now, for a sustain, sustainable uh, long term, is this sustainable? That's my first question. Um, the other thing is the cost recovery. What is the uh, what are the chances for us to get cost recovery from the other agencies? I agree that we should be true cost because we cannot be bearing costs for other services. But I just want to know what are the chances that we can recover from it. And at the bottom of the chart from uh, the annualization for 2022. I just want to understand more about scenario four and scenario five. Like that is the difference, how much it will cost us further down in 2022. So those are my first three questions for now. Thank you, Rosita. Um, Kirsten, do you want to take these? Sure. Um, well, Kirsten, I'll manage the cost recovery. If you want to take the other ones, I'll manage cost recovery. Yep, sounds perfect. Um, so the benefit stabilization reserve, we've had some discussions with the region and right now the forecasted balance in that reserve is greater than the targeted balance. And when they look at um, targeted balances, um, there's a bit of a range. And so within that, we've looked at the highest range. So we are comfortable that we are able to pull money um, from that reserve and it will in no ways um, negate um, the ability for that reserve to be fully funded in terms of its target. We've also looked um, and started the conversations with the region and this um, goes into our um, reserve strategy um, and in relation and in response to uh, the region's concern around long-term sustainability and the fact that we don't have appropriate reserves for some unfunded liabilities such as post-employment benefits um, or sick leave um, liabilities. We've had some discussions with them whether we can, um, you know, shift some of the money because that money is is a bit healthier um, into uh, a reserve such as uh, dealing with unfunded some of those unfunded liabilities to help um, kind of long term sustain sustainability as well. So I am comfortable at this point um, that it will in no ways um, negatively impact the reserve balance. Um, and just quickly on annualization, I did put a little asterisk beside the row that I felt would be impactful to 2022. And that includes the additional money for salary gapping of vacancies. Because of course, our long-term goal is that uh, we want the positions filled. Um, and then the other one again is the um, benefit stabilization reserve um, for phasing in benefits. Because again, like we, we will need to phase the, in these benefit costs um, over time. Cost Rosita, sorry, oh, go ahead, Chief. Sorry, uh, cost recovery, uh, one of my favorite uh, conversations because uh, it's very challenging. Um, so we've outlined some opportunities for cost recovery. Um, and so the, the question around how feasible is this, one of my concerns is about relationships at this stage in late in the game. So we know that our municipal budgets and our regional budgets are already fairly long along in process. Um, so they've been working, you know, as we have uh, over the last number of months uh, trying to get ready. So to begin a conversation around cost recovery, which is very much based a lot of it around uh, municipal dispatching, uh, communication center costs, um, my only concern is that if uh, the police services board directs me, I'm prepared to do it, but to engage the municipalities in a discussion of, listen, I'm going to start effective January 1st recovering costs, it has not given the municipalities enough time. 
I do believe that there's a larger discussion and dialogue because much of the cost recovery is around the 911 communication center. Um, as the board is aware in the 10 year capital plan with the next generation of 911 coming, um, our current communication centers end of life cycle. Um, under the Municipal Act, the Regional Municipality of Waterloo is responsible for the 911 Communication Center. Um, we have been working with all of the various agencies on voice radio. Um, it's been challenging. Um, it's not a cost that our municipalities have ever paid for, and now we are doing cost recovery. It's been a bit of a bumpy road. Uh, we still have some, some asphalt to smooth out, uh, um, and, and we'll get there. Um, but my recommendation on cost recovery is that if the board is strong and feels strongly about that, then staff should be directed to work towards 2022 uh, and actually look at how we actually uh, do business differently. Because I also think there's an opportunity for efficiencies within the municipalities, within the region and within the police service uh, around integration, uh, around a new communication facility and uh, really moving towards the recommendations of the Kimball report, which was a report commissioned by the Regional Waterloo and Council uh, around integration of communication and a different model. Um, so certainly prepared to have the conversation with our municipal partners. It's very, them have presented their draft budgets and for us now to show up and say, we're looking for this cost may create some challenges for them um, and may create some challenges on their internal mechanisms as well as the relationships we share. Thanks, Chief. I think moving forward, like in 2022, maybe we can do something. I think it's too late in the game just to, to do this anyway. Um, there was an announcement yesterday from the province regarding the 37 million um, funding for mental health. And I, I believe we have about 500,000. Uh, is there an impact to the budget? Like, is it, can it be incorporating the budget? So very excited to see the provincial government, uh, Minister Elliott and uh, Minister to Bolo announce uh, $37 million across the province. Um, I suspect that our region uh, does have money earmarked, uh, don't have a firm commitment, but uh, likely in the range of uh, $500,000 or so. Um, and that hopefully will expand our impact program. So it will actually provide support through CMHA to extend the hours so that we're providing a better continuity of care in our community. So it will not impact the WRPS budget, but what it will do is provide better enhanced mental health services uh, for calls for service where the police service is being asked to attend. Mental health clinicians will be available. There's also an opportunity, uh, Deputy Hilton and I and uh, Deputy Crowell have been dialoguing around uh, a mental health clinician in the communication center about triaging the call when it comes in and whether or not we can downstream it to a better uh, location. So whether that be paramedics, whether it be 24 seven and not requiring a police response. So look forward to more details. We'll update the board when they become available, but I do think our region uh, will bode well with this investment from the government. Although our budget won't. Rosita, any more questions? Okay, Sandy, please go ahead. Thank you. I'm just tagging on to the, uh, the fee for service sort of conversation. Um, and, and cost recovery, I guess, is, <laughs> is what it is. Um, we've had some of those discussions um, in it for different parts of our budget as well. And I, you know, in the end, the same people are paying for it, regardless of how you parse it out. And so I wonder if there are different ways that uh, that can be shown in the budget process uh, to, to sort of make it obvious to people that, you know, the police are, are providing this service. Um, it, it is uh, not part of our mandate, but uh, it, it, it may give a, a little different uh, perspective on exactly where the costs are, are being placed. It's a great feedback and uh, certainly in December we can break out where we provide, uh, you know, services to other agencies which in the end, we do believe uh, create a more efficient, integrated uh, public safety system. We do think there's value in supporting bylaw. We do think there's value in uh, our communication services and our voice radio services, as well as we do support the region around emergency management. Um, there's likely one area in December, we'd like to have a larger discussion and that's our investment in the Children's Safety Village. Uh, it's about $250,000 a year, a quarter million dollars that the service invests. Uh, as an in-kind and we do a lot of great things 
but the village is currently uh, obviously not in operation due to the pandemic. And is there an opportunity uh, for the board to consider um, actually uh, reallocating the quarter million dollars uh, into other projects within the service? Um, but that's a larger challenging discussion. Uh, we love children, we love the village, uh, but the reality is at some point uh, we have to make some hard decisions. Um, so you'll see that in December as a part of a, another mitigation strategy potentially. Thank you, uh, Karen, go ahead. Um, a few things just to build on um, sort of Sandy's and Rosita's comments. I know it is challenging to work with partners. I'm, um, and I think you're probably right that we may be too late for the cycle. I do strongly believe though that it's important to make sure that if you are getting benefits for some of these things uh, that you contribute um, to that in a fair way as well. Unfortunately, when people are looking at these numbers more broadly, some of this is a bit of inside baseball, right? So we know what we pay, what, but what the public sees is, well, how complete services is going up X percent and, you know, other people are being responsible and, and, you know, you don't see that increase where we know internally that we are actually shouldering some of the responsibility for others. So I think, you know, in recognition that we may be a bit late in the process, I, uh, I echo what Rosita was saying that I think those it's important to start and then have a long transition as part of that conversation for the next fiscal year so that people have a lot of time then to be able to adjust to what that looks like, you know, sort of in, in, the, in terms of sort of responsibility centered modeling and that kind of stuff. Um, I think, uh, Chief, you raised a really important point and I think it's, it was in the consent consent agenda, so we didn't have an opportunity to discuss it. But, you know, when I was reading through the, the information related to that, the fact that 94% of the people that we surveyed, and if I recall, these are people, you know, it's not even just sort of pure general pop, these are people that were slightly disproportionately, you know, had some issues with policing services in our, in our region, that 94% and the vast majority, you know, like a, a very high chunk of that wanted to see more police officers, not fewer police officers. So 94% wanted us to keep the line or hire more, wanted an increased presence. And I think that blew me away when I saw that, when I saw that response from the community. And so as we think about this in terms of staffing, and I think the idea of, okay, what can't we do, you know, in related to this, that we hear so many different messages out there. And I think what we've been talking about is how do we transform services? That's going to take a while. I certainly also took from that scan and that, that strategic, um, all of that um, great information in that, in that long-term and, you know, community outreach, um, you know, that people want to keep that partnership, that they, you know, to your point that sometimes there aren't people to respond to these calls at three in the morning, that our partners want to have the service there to continue to be partners. It wasn't that they were looking for complete responsibility. It was a model that works well. Um, my my last question, I, I actually, because I'm just actually quite curious about this, and I think this is probably how you just do with budget reporting, and it's the the comment we made, but also in the documents that we read about the fact that we are going to have a surplus, right? And so surpluses this year don't help with continuity, right? Like that's not like we're getting that money added to the base every year, and so you can cover it. It's sort of a one-year blip because of the weird situation we find ourselves in. So could you just, could somebody just speak a little bit to me about what is that, what does that surplus mean in terms of our conversations around budget planning right now? I would just find that very helpful. Thanks so much, uh, Ms. Nard. Kirsten, do you want to uh, uh, take a, you know, obviously uh, you have a whole strategy around uh, managing and some of it uh, we find ourselves based on your mitigation strategies during the pandemic. So over to you, Kirsten. Hello. Um, so yes, the surplus in 2020 is predominantly related to the higher than expected vacancies that we've seen um, from our personnel. Um, we've had discussions internally as to, um, you know, looking at, at the surplus and, and potential mitigation um, strategies around um, next year's budget. And as you mentioned, um, you know, the, they're distinct years. So um, typically what occurs is that um, we allocate our surplus towards our reserves. Um, one of them being the general reserve, which we maintain a $2 million balance that would go against unexpected activities, such as um, whether we potentially one year uh, ran a deficit or um, through uh, a bargaining um, of which we're in the progress of now, 
um, you know, results come in that were not anticipated and, uh, and it could mitigate, um, you know, financial impacts as a result of that as well. So the other piece that we put our surplus to is our capital reserve, and that then helps us to fund um, capital projects through reserve funding instead of debt. And again, that was um, from the reports from the region in terms of long-term sustainability, um, the concerns um, from the regional CFO that um, across the region, we, um, we focus too much on debt funding in comparison to other regions, um, which has a future cost impact as well. So we've been looking at some of the projects such as the BI tools project, which was intended to be funded through debt, whether we could um, develop strategies to shift some of that funding from um, the reserve um, through some of the uh, surplus money this year, as well as do we need to pull money from the benefit stabilization reserve um, this year um, in light of the surplus as well. So looking at kind of healthier strategies that will reduce costs in the long term. Thank you. Karen, is that your, okay? Any further questions? So I, I look at this and um, I commend uh, staff for all the work they've done. And I, I think the uh, context within which these reports have come forward um, is really helpful. I personally am far more comfortable with the uh, budget increase of 2.9 over 3.4. And Ms. Schnarr already brought up the, the issue of the fact that we do have a surplus this year. And I'm wondering, have we exhausted um, cannabis funding? Um, I know, Chief, you talked about the investment in the Children's Safety Village. And so I would, I know we have another budget meeting to come back to. So I would be uh, very interested in, um, in pardon the expression, but if, if we sharpened our focus and our pencils a little bit and maybe came back um, to have a fuller discussion on what 2.9 would be, I may be the only one that feels that way, but um, it just seems to me that this is great work so far, so I would like to sort of see the full context before we settled on uh, what kind of increase we'd be looking at. Chief? No, uh, this is the purpose of the dialogue is obviously uh, to solicit feedback and see where we're uh, comfortable with. And uh, ultimately the board is uh, responsible for the financial governance. And um, so we will uh, continue to work as a team. And I do wanna highlight uh, this has been a team effort and, and give credit to all of our senior leaders who have been a large part of this discussion. So uh, we will return in December uh, looking at, uh, um, is it safe to say, looking at the scenario uh, three and four uh, in the sense of how we actually move from four to three, et cetera, what other options are. And we will uh, look at other uh, cost reductions uh, that are available, i.e. Uh, potentially uh, reallocation. Uh, and of course, as you raise uh, we are in a position of uh, a potential, uh, well, we are in a position of a positive variance. So what does that look like? So we'll definitely uh, look at that. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, Ian, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would, I don't know if we need direction over that's certainly where I'm at is it's a scenario three or four. Um, and what that looks like in, in terms of refining uh, the, the budget and the opportunities. One risk of, and I, it, it is great that we've got that surplus, but um, I'm cautious about using one-time sources to kind of um, smooth over this year's budget, uh, simply because it just adds pressure to next year's. But uh, I would I would concur with the chair that you know exploring options three and four is where my comfort level would be. Um, if so, I don't know if you need a motion, Chair Redman, or whether hey, I that's think enough, enough direction for the chief. I think that, that direction is enough, Ian. I guess I would just ask other board members, if there anybody that thinks another scenario should be pursued, if you can indicate otherwise, the uh, chief and his team will take that away. And I would tell you, chief, really good work. Like this is, it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, Councillor Kiefer and Mayor Schantz and I all recognize that. This is our truck and trade for the next few months. Um, so we've provided direction. Um, new business, is there any new business? Any future agenda items? Information items? So I would now uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Move by 
Karen, seconded by Ian. All those in favor? Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, media who are on the call, if you have logged in, uh, Jill and Sherry Greeno are now gonna take over this part of the meeting. Jill, should I turn it over to you? Okay, so five minutes. Any board member who wants to stay is welcome.